Aloha, and welcome to this evening's forum of OHA trustee candidates. My name is Lemomi Khan, and I am the chair of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. And my name is Rayton Vars, uh, second vice chair for the uh, Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. The Hawaiian Affairs Caucus is an entity of the Democratic Party of Hawaii and seeks to address issues of self-determination, protection of Hawaiian cultural practices and sacred sites, pono economic development, protection of Hawaii's natural resources, both on the aina and the kai, housing, health, education. We do this work through educational and legislative advocacy. This evening, we are happy to host an OHA Trustee Candidates Forum uh, in partnership with Olelo's Vote Informed Program. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs election is nonpartisan, and all registered voters in the state of Hawaii uh, can vote for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs Trustee positions. Accordingly, the purpose of our candidate forum tonight is to educate you, the voters, on issues of key importance to the Native Hawaiian community. There will be three sessions to this evening's program featuring various candidates. The six to seven o'clock session will feature trustee Carmen Hulu Lindsay running for re-election to the Maui seat, Makana Paris, Pohai Ryan, and Kelly E. Make Kau who are running for one of the three at-large seats. The 715 to 815 session will feature Kalea Kaka and Jackie Burke who are running for the Oahu resident seat, C. Kawi Amsterdam, and Landon Paikai, who are running for one of three OHA at-large seats. The 8.30 to 9.30 session will feature Trustee Lei Ahu Isa, William Isla Jr., and Brendan Kalei Aina Lee, who are running for the three OHA at-large seats, as well as Esther Kia Aina and Samuel Wilder King II, who are running for the Oahu seat as well. Candidates will be given two minutes to provide opening remarks, followed by the opportunity to answer questions concerning fiscal management responsibility, governance, and delivery of programs and services to, the, to, to Native Hawaiians, and then provide closing remarks. Our facilitators today are Jacob Ryan Aki and Kainoa Kaumeheiva Rago. Our timekeeper is Melody Aduha. All are members of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. All Maka'ainana volunteers just believing in Native Hawaiians and, and doing, doing the work for our people. So let's begin. Jacob and Kainoa e Holomua. Aloha kako. To get things started, we will begin with opening remarks of two minutes by each candidate. And we start with Trustee Carmen Hulu Lindsay, who is seeking re election for the Maui seat. Aloha, Trustee Lindsay. Aloha. Aloha, Mai Kako. Aloha. I am Carmen Hulu Lindsay, your Maui Oha trustee. It has been my very real honor to represent and serve the Office of Hawaiian Affairs for the past six years. I am presently the chairperson of the Resource Management Committee of the Board of Trustees. And this committee is responsible for all the lands, our legacy and commercial, and all of the money from our investment portfolio, ceded lands and commercial real estate revenues are all my kuleana in overseeing their management. The most important issue facing Hawaiians today is our people's economic and cultural survival for the future. Economic survival requires employment, education, and the ability to remain in Hawaii. First is education. OHA can pursue this in conjunction with our other Hawaiian educational institutions and associations, including the Kamehameha Schools, the University Center for Hawaiian Studies, and Hawaii Nui Akea, as well as our Hawaiian language teachers, beginning with our youth, Punana Leo, Kapapakai. We need to support Hawaiians in economic development, including small and large business. I am excited tonight to be able to share this table with 
with these candidates that offer us a choice of who can serve us. And they are willing, able, and I look forward to a very healthy discussion of the issues that face the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Mr. Makana Paris, who is a candidate for, for an at-large seat. Makana? Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Makana Paris, and I am running for OHA at large. I was born and raised in Nanakuli, live in Papakolea, and farm on Hawaii Island. I grew up farming and fishing, and am part of a family that have struggled with incarceration, mental illness, and drug abuse. And I was houseless for a time. Through the trust of Princess Powahi, I was given a place to live, boarding at Kamehameha Schools, and graduated in 1998. Our resilient communities supported me through my education. I went on to earn an environmental degree from MIT a master's from the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara, and a Juris Doctor from Hawaii's own William S. Richardson School of Law. Our communities gifted me with my experiences and education, and now is my time to give back. As a trustee of OHA, I would have a legal, ethical, and cultural responsibility to stabilize the office and grow the trust resources to fulfill its mandate improving the conditions of Native Hawaiians and all of Hawaii. The methods and means of 20 and 30 years ago do not work today and will not work 20 and 30 years from now. It is time for a new direction. However, as we change, we must continue to embrace the wisdom of our elders, work collaboratively with each other, and mentor those that will continue the work after we are gone. As such, I will honor a fiduciary's duty of care, good faith, loyalty, and disclosure to the beneficiaries, and I will work to rebuild trust in OHA by prioritizing economic drivers that promote education, housing, jobs, health care for Native Hawaiians, and all of Hawaii. Mahalo. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Pohai Ryan, who is another candidate for an at-large seat. Pohai? Aloha. My name is Pohai Ryan. As a young teen growing up on Molokai, I witnessed the women in our community, one of them my mother, who took me everywhere to all the community meetings. I witnessed how important it was for them to create a body, an institution that can dedicate resources and time to elevating and uplifting our people and improving their condition. It was a very exciting time, time of the Hawaiian Renaissance. OHA was developed at the same time. So was PKO and Kaho'olawe. I saw the excitement, the vision, but more important, their intent. That is the most important qualification I feel for a trustee. You can have as much education as possible, but really it comes down to, is your intent truly to serve our people? Our people are what matters. Here we are 40 years later. Has the community made a significant shift in improving the lives and conditions of our people? That is why I'm running. My experience from the State Senate brings a lot of knowledge and understanding of how government works in Hawaii. And also my service and volunteer in Hawaiian Civic Clubs as president, also as a former president of the Kamehameha Schools Alumni Association. I won that position advocating for the less fortunate and the children that Powahi intended to serve. I want to return to the service of our people, serving in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs as a trustee. Mahalo. Thank you, Powahi. Last but not least, we have Mr. Kelly Makeko, who is another candidate for an at-large seat. Kelly. Aloha. Uh, thank you for the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus for hosting this event. Uh, this is not my first rodeo in this event, so for those of you watching and seeing that, that's the same guy. He's here again, fifth time. Uh, but my name is Kelly Imakika. Uh, I'm 47 years old, born and raised here on the island of Oahu. Grew up in the Ahupua of Honolulu. Uh, graduated from St. Louis High School in 1988. Um, upon going through college and furthering um, 
I had to become a caregiver for my, one of my parents. Uh, subsequently, went to work in the hotel industry and balanced that off until, uh, unfortunately, my mom's demise. Um, after going through that little stint of uh, you know, hotel industry, a little career change, I became involved with Building Management Homeowners Association. Uh, I got my accreditation with IRAM for being an accredited resident manager. Um, been involved with uh, homeowners associations now for about over 12 to 13 years as a resident site manager. Uh, very familiar with what bylaws, uh, institutions, house rules, um, rules of play, byways, and enforcing house rules and so, so forth, and, and dealing with basically people who live in the housing area. Uh, one of the companies that I was very proud to work with was Hawaiiana, which at that time was involved. Uh, where OHA was involved. So as I got to sneak out over the years and go down two floors to the Office of Foreign Affairs to see what was going on, thus my interest in the, uh, the wheelings and dealings of Office of Foreign Affairs. And this basically, you know, I got labeled as being a you know, de facto trustee because I was there so much at the time that I got to know the pros and cons. Um, I saw some very good things happening there, but unfortunately I also saw some very bad things happening there. Um, with the with the help of the things like your caucus, we managed to get involved with uh, government activities and help to push through things like uh, the primary bill, which you folks passed. And of course, even since Pohai was the senator, we managed to get that to to strengthen our democracy as a Hawaiian to give us a better voice and playing field to help narrow the scope and whatnot. Um, I hope to bring that and my other continued success to, with OHA to help uh, tighten things up a bit and uh, move it forward together. So our keiki and our other people can enjoy a more prosperous lifestyle. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, well let's dive right in. Yeah, <clears throat> Regarding OHA's fiscal management responsibilities, we have two questions for you. By way of background, the Hawaii State Constitution, Article 12, Section 6, provides that the OHA board shall exercise power as provided by law to manage and administer the proceeds from the sale or other disposition of the lands, natural resources, minerals, and income derived from whatever sources for Native Hawaiians and Hawaiians, including all income and proceeds from the pro rata portion of the public trust referred to in Section 4 of Article 12 for Native Hawaiians. Question 1. This year, the State Attorney General issued two reports of their audit of the of Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Both reports found the need for improvement in the management and administration of the OHA funds. Specifically, the AG found problems with the approval and accountability process for spending OHA income. If elected as an OHA trustee, how will you assure that income is properly spent and that the OHA administrator, staff, and trustees themselves are held accountable? You each have one minute to answer the question. We'll begin with candidate Makikau, followed by trustee Lindsay, then candidate Paris, and candidate Ryan. Mr. Makikau. Thank you for the question. Uh, I've been on, this year alone, I've been on record. There have actually been two state audits that have come out in Lightning, very scathing as they've been uh, highlighting certain discrepancies in different fields and so forth. There's actually a third internal audit that has happened, but uh, hasn't taken place yet due to, um, I guess, some in-house in uh, pilikia that's happening over there. But we'll get to that in another time. And but. Uh, as far as to address the problem of financial malfeasance is what I think is happening over there, I have an answer, and I've, I've stated it before in other forums. In the CFO's office position, we need to install an internal auditor. This position should be given special privileges and powers and immunity so that it reports its findings to the Board of Trustees and the state auditor. And also have a whistleblower policy so that if any OHA staff member who has works on grants and so forth comes across a discrepancy, he can go to this um, position without any fear of reprimand and so forth so that his findings are made public and go for it there and report it to the state auditor. That is, ensures trans, uh, transparency and accountability and is fair to the staff and that because that's our money, all of us here. So, that's a Mahalo Nui, Trustee Lindsay. Thank you, Kelly. E. Very, very good ideas. When I became the resource management committee chairperson two years ago, I became aware of some of the problems raised in the audit. I thought of addressing the problems in three ways. First, trustees must support and work with the state auditor for complete disclosure of all information, fiscal and programmatic, 
in order to be accountable and transparent. I have done this with the state programmatic and grant, and grant audits. We have begun implementing the audit recommendations, giving priority to those areas where there were inadequate oversight of fiscal allocations. Second, under my leadership, the Resource Management Committee and the Board of Trustees voted unanimously to approve an internal audit by an external auditor for OHA, fo focusing on fraud, waste, and abuse. There has been much public media coverage on the investigation into OHA for public corruption by state and federal agencies. This second audit, initiated by the trustees, is examining activities and disbursements of our people's trust assets. As the RM chair, I plan to participate fully in this forensic audit and will support a full public disclosure of the audit's findings. Nominee trustee, President Paris. Mahalo. The audits did exactly what an audit is supposed to do. They pointed out areas for improvement and greater accountability. Now is the time to act. And the current board, under leadership of trustee Hulu Lindsay, have actually taken steps in order to get more information, in order to figure out what things need to be improved upon. As an OHA trustee, my kuleana would be limited to serving as a fiduciary of the trust for the betterment of Native Hawaiians. As a fiduciary of the trust, I would have a legal responsibility to stabilize OHA and grow the trust's resources coming back to its primary mission, improving the conditions of Native Hawaiians to the betterment of all of Hawaii. Because when Native Hawaiians prosper, Hawaii prospers. That is my vision, that is my kuleana. This means working with fellow trustees, this means creating clear expectations and goals for employees and programs, clearer relationships between the trust and its beneficiaries, and clearer relationships between OHA and the state. Mahalo. Mahalo. Candidate Ryan. I've said this in all previous forums. Government audits are meant to improve an agency. I agreed with most of the findings in the audits. They were not unreasonable. They were cited uh, based on what they found. Um, some required a lot more information, but in general, the audit was a good thing. What was also good is that the, trust, the current trustees have taken steps to address some of the issues that were cited in the audit. Um, I think that the audit also reveals other things that are wrong that could be improved. Um, as I continue to research, I realize that there's a need for better management systems and processes. And there's also a lack of shared information when it's necessary. I think that has been creating a lot of the confusion and misunderstandings. But there needs to be clear parameters, definitely, on spending, the way the um, trustees guide the CEO and the work of um, OHA. We are the elected trustees. That would be our duty. Mahalo nui. Question two. The state's obligation to Native Hawaiians is firmly established in our Constitution. How the state satisfies that constitutional obligation requires policy decisions that are primarily within the authority and expertise of the legislative branch. One of the policy decisions is the amount to be transferred to the OHA branch from public lands. More than a decade has passed since the enactment of Act 178, Session Laws of Hawaii 2006, that sent an annual interim figure of $15, $15 million. Over the last few years, bills have been introduced to require that government officials study and make written recommendations on the proposed annual amount of interim income and proceeds from the Public Land Trust that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs shall receive annually. In spite of the efforts to get all parties to the table, little progress has been made to have this issue addressed. If elected as an OHA trustee, what strategy would you advocate for to get the state to update the annual amount of income and proceeds from the Public Land Trust due to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs? Again, one minute each to answer this question. We'll begin with candidate Ryan, followed by candidate Paris, candidate Makiakao, and trustee Lindsay. Candidate Ryan. First, previous to this year's legislative session, I was very impressed with OHA's efforts to educate the broader community about the problem about the trust 
um, public land trust and income due to OHA that has not been paid. When I served in the Senate, um, it was very disheartening to find that the legislature is not releasing the funds in a timely manner, but also it felt like punishment, a per parent punishing a child, which I feel is unfair and inappropriate. But as trustees, I think we need to look at what is not being effective. If our um, lobbyists or representatives at the Capitol are not being impactful in the way we need them to do things, we need to reevaluate the strategy because this is definitely the right of OHA and it should be paid to OHA. And we have to continue to fight for that. Oh, yeah. Candidate Paris. Mahalo. As an OHA trustee, I am a fiduciary of the trust. And a key element is growing the trust asset base. There are two steps I see must be taken. First, we need to rebuild trust in OHA and its trustees themselves. Only by working together from a position of unity and solidarity will the board be able to credibly engage and invite state agencies, legislators, and the administration to the table. Second, sitting at the table is not enough. The second is that OHA the state agencies and the state itself need to conduct mutually agreed upon proper accounting of the public trust resources and the current revenue levels. Without accurate data, no amount of conversation will create real change. I have a successful track record of instigating legislative change through coalition building and trust relationships as the president of the Prince Kohi Hawaiian Civic Club and as a research analyst for the Iron Worker Stabilization Fund. And I hope you will empower me to use that experience to, to serve OHA and the state in this way. Mahalo. Mahalo, Mr. Paris. Candidate Makikau. Sadly, for that question, uh, most of the time I spoke to people, most of the general populace, not even Native Hawaiians, are even aware of 178. They're still operating in the past that OHA's bank, if you will, is 20% of the ceded lands right off the bat. It's, it's kind of ironic that it was initiated really after the ceded land settlement. And we got Kakaako Makai, and everything was supposed to be wiped clean. And then we had a now a reorganization. But now we're starting to build debt again with the legislature. So we're sort of back to stage one. Um, to tell you the truth, honestly, uh, this is not my forte of a speaking uh, point. I love what I hear from my fellow candidates, so I defer to their expertise in the matter. My thing would be, uh, as far as engagement with it, we are constitutionally recognized. Like I learned at an OHA workshop from um, Marjorie Bronster. She said, that means we have teeth, we have substance, we have law on our side. If it means holding press conferences or sending out a legislative package to the legislature that says, either follow the rules that are in place or we will sue your ass or whatnot, that's what needs to be done. That's the letter of the law. That's what needs to be followed. If they can't handle their obligation, years like this when it's legislative, they get ousted too. And that's how a democracy works. That's the law. We are a land of laws. That's what we need to follow. Thank you. Mahalo. Trustee Lindsay. Thank you. I too believe that we should be getting our fair share. Uh, we did uh, run a study and we're receiving less than half of what we should be receiving. Um, in advocating for the legislature to release those funds to us, I got the feeling that the legislators were looking at OHA's budget and felt that we were overspending. And in fact, they verbalized it uh, in, in the committee. Um, as a result, when the subject matter came up before the legislators, they passed it by. I believe that, um, as suggested by candidate Paris, that maybe we need to get our house in order a little better so that we can earn the trust of the legislature and, and have them give us what, is our, what we deserve and what is ours to use for our people. Thank you. Thank you. Each candidate was given a list of four questions and they were asked to select two concerning programs and services to Native Hawaiians. Candidates Lindsay, Paris, and Ryan chose to answer the first question which is, as a candidate for trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, do you agree with the current approach of grants to 
organizations to deliver programs and services to native Hawaiians? If yes, why do you believe the approach is effective? If not, what approach would you advocate for? Trustee Lindsay, you will go first, followed by candidate Paris, and last is candidate Ryan. You will each have 60 seconds to answer the question. Thank Trustee you. Lindsay, you are first. I believe that the way we are giving out grants today is uh, a good way. And the reason I believe in that is because uh, the people giving the services and receiving the grants are 501c3s, and they're specialized in, in the, the jobs that they do, which means that um, we, we have a competitive um, process and they're each trying to outdo each other, which gives us the best services for our people. Um, they have to demonstrate the project design is comprehensive and complete, and their information will include overall goals and specific objectives, activities, and timeline. They need to demonstrate how the proposed approach and methodology is effective and efficient in addressing the needs of the Hawaiian community and how project activities align with the focus of this solicitation. So I do believe that we're doing the right thing and the people that are, um, are chosen are chosen by a group of people instead of an individual. Thank you. Mr. Paris, you are next. Kako'o, yes, I support what Trustee Lindsay said. I think that OHA's grants to local organizations to deliver programs and services to Native Hawaiians is a good direction for the organization. However, I believe that OHA can and should improve the execution, monitoring, and accountability of these grants. And through assisting local organizations with fiscal, administrative, and technical to support to maximize the effectiveness of OHA's local involvement. It's really hard when people don't know that the money that OHA is using going to the nonprofits is touching their children, their families, their elders, and that is part of the problem. Additionally, grants cannot be the only strategy that OHA uses in pursuit of its mission. As we work to rebuild trust and improve the well-being of Native Hawaiians and all of Hawaii, OHA must prioritize investments in economic drivers that promote education, housing, jobs, and health care. Ms. Ryan? I agree with both Trustee Hulu Lindsay and uh, Candidate Paris. Um, I do want to make a distinguish, I want to distinguish between grants, contracts, and sponsorship. A lot of people are very confused and get the three, um, mistaken the three for being the same. I've also heard uh, disturbing comments from the broader public that OHA is now becoming a cash cow to assist um, bigger nonprofits, which is fine. Collaborations are fine, but we always have to remember how many lives, how many Hawaiians are being touched by the services that are being supported by OHA. OHA also needs to do a better job in acknowledging what they are doing in the community so people understand that they are doing things. Also, um, with the sponsorship, I feel that um, it could be improved or reduced actually because the grants that help them, especially the human services and housing should be expanded because those are very urgent needs in our community right now. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Ryan. The second question was chosen for response by Trustee Lindsay. The question is, regarding health, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs issued two reports recently one on the health of Native Hawaiian men and the other on the health of Native Hawaiian women. Additionally, OHA has tef testified on numerous occasions about the impact of social determinants on Native Hawaiian health. If re-elected as trustee, what kinds of programs and services would you advocate for to improve the health of Native Hawaiians? You have 60 seconds, ma'am. Thank you. I chose that subject because I wanted to encourage everyone to read the reports that were done by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. The health potential of Native Hawaiian females is influenced by several indicators of wellness. Their social determinants of health, barriers throughout infancy and adolescence often continue into adulthood, where wahine face significant disparities in cancer, 
are overrepresented in the criminal justice system and try to prosper despite alarming pay gaps. Historical disconnect from cultural practices, ohana and aina, has led to further disruption in wahine well-being and in turn negatively affected the overall wellness of the Hawaiian community. To support contemporary wahine, policy changes and advocacy across various agencies and organizations is necessary. Supporting cultural integration and resourcing community-based programming is essential to, revital to revitalize Native Hawaiian females and improve their wellness. Mahalo. Question three was chosen for response by candidates Ryan and Makeko. The question is, regarding the homeless, Native Hawaiians are at the top of the list of those homeless in our state. If elected as trustee, what kinds of programs and services would you advocate to help Native Hawaiians who are homeless? Also, in what ways can OHA help to assure that, that our people have access to affordable housing? Candidate Ryan, you will go first, and candidate Makikau, you will go second. Ms. Ryan? First, I have to state that I disagree that Native Hawaiians are the highest ethnic group that is homeless. In reading and researching online, I found that there was a study done by HOPE, and they indicate that 33% of the homeless are Native Hawaiians, but it does not cite who the other 67% are. So it could be that during the contact that they just asked the question, are you Hawaiian? And no other question was asked among the homeless. I'm not denying that we have a high amount of homeless and it needs to be addressed and we should be participating in solving the problem with the rest of the organizations and agencies in the community. But I think a higher need really is affordable home ownership because we have a lot of hidden homeless in our generations that are living together that are causing extreme stressors on our people that lead to negative social um, statistics, whether it be domestic relations, poor domestic relations, um, poor health, um, and just the lack of security and safety of a dwelling, which to me is the highest priority for our people. Thank you. Mr. Makeko? I would concur that my, one of my first priorities, if not top priority, is housing. Um, I grew up in a 900 square unit apartment with a class 85 brother who from Kamehameha Schools who ransacked my childhood, but I still love him <laughs> and whatnot. But uh, we had a home, we had a house, uh, we had love, and we had a platform in which to do something from whatnot. Failure was always an option too, but if you have at least a platform, a safety net to do something, you have the potential, the opportunity like anyone else to thrive off of. The statistics and numbers that we keep seeing, these people don't have that. All they have is what's in front of them, and that's basically a survival instinct, mm -hmm. and that takes on many forms and faces, fortunately many ugly and whatnot. OHA is already engaged in some of their priority missions, and housing, health, and some other ones are already there. We just gotta tighten up and straighten and get the fundings, stop the bleeding from these other ones that are not working and just shift the water over to them and fill up these lo'is and trust me you will see responses it's not only proven in the hawaiian ones but mainland nationwide you take care of your people you house them they will come forward and assume leadership roles like how we're doing too thank you uh, candidates paris and make chose to answer question four the question is regarding education Native Hawaiians have scored disproportionately lower than non-Native Hawaiians on standardized tests. As an elected OHA trustee, what is your opinion about the cause of this low performance on standardized educational tests, and what programs or services would you advocate for to facilitate Native Hawaiians doing better on educational tests? We'll begin with candidate Paris to be followed by candidate Makikau. Mr. Paris. Mahalo. I see two leading factors. First, an educational system that struggles to leverage Hawaiian culture and values learned in community to performance, plain and simple, under valuement of the culture and values. Second, the challenging conditions that many Native Hawaiians find themselves in, living paycheck to paycheck, eviction on the horizon, deciding between medication, food, utilities, or childcare, 
and the dream of home ownership is more like a nightmare. Studies show that lower outcomes in education, income, and healthcare, and other ills are commonly rooted in the lack of access to one thing, and Brada brought it up, housing, safe and affordable housing. So yes, OHA should advocate for and fund programs that directly improve educational outcomes for Native Hawaiians, but only if we address the structural and systemic reasons for these outcomes too. That is why we must rebuild trust and prioritize investment in economic drivers that promote education, job, healthcare, and especially housing. <laughs> Mahalo. Mr. Makika. Very good answer, Marilyn. Uh, education, such a such a you know crucial uh, crucial um, element here. Look at our ancestors, the Kingdom of Hawaii. At one time, John Webster said, "This is the most literate nation in the world." What happened? We had many, many, many forces, many, many entities, many, so much stuff come here, but yet our people somehow could not latch on to this and felt disproportionately. And now we're here today always re rehashing the negatives about what it is and what not. So how do we get our kids involved in learning and what not? We got to reach them out as, when they're young. And first, that requires a good home, a good base, loving parents. If the parents are not there, the kid will not respond, you know. This guy's got a great education system. Look at his story and whatnot. How do we get our kids to follow the path like Makana did and whatnot? Again, OHA has the grants and the policies and stuff over there. We just don't see them come to life. We just got to get the money and the resources there and get our young leaders involved, and it's going to take off and so forth. So I don't beat around the bush. I don't give you fancy metaphors. It's there. We just got to start swinging the mechanism and get it going, get the machine going. It'll be there. Thank you. We now move to the topic of governance. A key goal of the OHA Strategic Plan 2010 to 2018 is to facilitate a process that would give Hawaiians the opportunity to create a governing entity that would define Native Hawaiians as a political group rather than a racial group. The benefit of such, a governing entity would be allowed to provide Native Hawaiians with greater control over their destiny as they move towards self-determination and self-sufficiency. If elected as an OHA trustee, how would you advance this goal and would you provide funding to enable achievement of this goal? You have 60 seconds to answer this question. Candidate Paris, you will go first. Candidate Makeko, you will be second. Candidate Ryan, you will be third. And trustee Lindsay, you will be last. Candidate Paris. Mahalo. Recognition of Native Hawaiians by the federal government is a hugely important issue that requires careful thought and investigation, and our communities have been doing that. OHA has provided funding for our communities to do that. OHA is in a very unique position now to fund the political, social, and economic studies needed to be able to understand how to make an informed decision of moving forward together, collectively. As Vice Chair of AHA 2016, I've been an advocate in the push for more scholarly study of the potential benefits and costs of recognition. OHA can leverage its resources to not only study these issues, but create a pool of Native Hawaiian experts who are able to advise our own community, understanding our values, our worldview, knowing our land and our aina on all aspects of self-determination. But OHA needs to be trusted again to make these proposals a reality. So, OHA, trustees, here, potentially, we will rebuild trust so that our communities can engage that important question. Mahalo. Next, we have candidate Makeko. Uh, put it bluntly, um, I am not in support of the governing entity, federal recognition as it's called. Uh, I've been studying this since 2000 when they basically came out. Um, the lure of federal recognition is partially to blame for the, di the, the divide in the community. Are Native Hawaiians Native Americans? Or is our status similar? No, we are not. We had our own country. We are distinct from the continent. We are not Native. We are treated, though, by Congress as Native Americans. Therefore, we qualify at, for grants and so forth. So how do you then petition the government to be federal rec recognized? You have, would have to follow the same model as Alaska Natives. We'd have to surrender our land claims and so forth. The sovereignty movement is basically predicated on the kingdom never 
relinquished itself. Lilio Kalani filed a formal protest, which still has legal standing till today. Unfortunately, our Hawaiian community is not ready to undergo an extensive subject matter as that. That's why we have a lot of splintering in, in it. Office of Hawaiian Affairs should stop the funding for federal recognition. It has yielded no results. And instead, governance should be um, step, take a step back. And, and if anything, the money that go through it go through the other projects. And independence should be also funded by uh, um, OHA as a, as a value point to explore at least. Again, it's an extensive su subject matter. It needs to be studied more. Thank you. Candidate Ryan? For those of us who are old enough to remember this, like a quote that was said earlier, this is not the first rodeo. It was quite exciting in the 80s uh, when the Capitol was filled with Kanaka protesting advocacy for some form of governance and independence. The body of nine trustees will not determine that. The people will. I think it's OHA's duty to provide resources that do support venues, uh, means of education, but not in small pockets. We need to have broad, big events and convenings in the community that is part of the outreach division that has substantive discussions that are real. We can't keep discussing this. It'll go, it'll continue. But then after attending the Filipino Independence Gala last month and realizing it took them 300 years of proud people showing their documentary, it was very exciting. So maybe we are in the infant stage of that. Thank you. Trustee Lindsay. Thank you. That's a very in important subject. I believe that our people should have some kind of governance but I was not in support of Na'iaupuni or Kana'iolovalu. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because I didn't feel that it was inclusive of all of our people. Um, I believe that uh, we should come together as, um, as Hawaiians and do it uh, in a manner where everyone will have their voice and then we will uh, vote on it in a democracy. And whatever the results is, is uh, the results that all of our people should accept and come together so that we can unite once and for all. Uh, if it is a structure, including everyone, I believe that there should be some financing by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs because that's probably the only place with monies that can uh, pay for that kind of uh, get together. The second question concerning governance is, do you support a Hawaii Constitutional Convention or a CONCON? If so, why or why not? Uh, you have 60 seconds again. We'll begin with candidate Paris, followed by candidate Ryan, trustee Lindsay, and then candidate Makikau. Mr. Paris. Mahalo. I support civic engagement and civic education, including preparing for constitutional conventions. For the constitutionally the Constitution currently calls for el the electorate to take up the question of a convention regularly. Now, OHA was founded as a direct result of a constitutional convention in 78, and it is the only organization of its kind in the United States treating the assets of First Peoples, Native Peoples, Native Hawaiians. I believe OHA can support and educate on the Constitution and showcase the amazing work done in 78 including the enshrinement of worker rights to collective bargaining, access rights, environmental protections, and the establishment of the office. If a convention happens, OHA could advocate for common sense changes that prioritize investments in economic drivers to promote housing, jobs, health care, and education for Native Hawaiians and all of Hawaii. And it can more effectively do civic education by rebuilding trust in the office itself. Mahalo. Mahalo nui. Ms. Ryan. Again, those of us that are older and witnessed the exciting process of the first CONCON, um, from that created great leaders that went on to serve in the legislature, many of them Native Hawaiian. I am against um, a CONCON because I feel the risk is too high. The, con the constitutional um, document was created in a time when Hawaiians, it was favorable for Hawaiians. I think right now there's too much education needed for people to understand the purposes of why 
OHA was created and other rights that we have today. Until we do that, it's a very high risk to our programs, to our entitlements, and to our social, our push for social justice for our people. So I do not support a constitutional convention. Um, I think that it could be a platform to have discussions on it, but the risk is too great. And I am not willing as a trustee or even as a citizen to support that. Trustee Lindsay, your mana'o. Thank you. I have to say that I agree with candidate Pohai Ryan uh, with everything that she said. However, if it is voted upon that we do have a constitutional convention, I want to say that we should, the Hawaiians, OHA, our people, we should organize ourselves so that our Hawaiians are excited about running for seats at the Constitutional Convention so that our voices can be heard and that we can protect these programs that we have available for our people. Thank you. Mahalo Nui and Mr. Makikau. Excellent manao by these three candidates. So I can only offer a little bit more. I too am against the uh, Kantan uh, for two specific reasons. One is a just a general basis there. If you cannot enforce the laws and the books that are on place now, how in the hell are you expected to somehow draft or sharpen the teeth of them and expect them to be enforced anywhere? And it's not the fault of OHA. It's a fault of you know the legislature, the executive, other branches of government here. This is just the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. But to go deeper, this is the year of the Hawaiian. A tentative plan that was put into place was that OHA itself, when a governing entity, the Nayapuni people came out, they were supposed to draft a constitution that was supposed to be presented to the people and ratified. Thus, this new tribal entity was supposed to take its place up and running. And next thing you know, with the year of the Hawaiian, some Hawaiian people were going to vote on it. With the Kan Kan in place, that entity was supposed to take its place. And the leadership of now, this Office of Foreign Affairs has touted the public many times that it would abolish itself in favor of transferring its assets into that governing entity. However, with all of the hakaka and everything that we haven't seen that happen, so that was part of the initial plan, or at least to some, a plan, an action that was supposed to take place via that con con. So there are some, you know, little special interest involvement here too. Just want to let you know, give you guys some awareness of that. But the overall sense is usually on what I stated earlier. We can't, we can't, we can't take care of your house rules generally. New house rules are not going to work either. Thank you. You know, this has been a great forum with a lot of great questions, a lot of serious questions, a lot of hard questions. You know, Kainoa, you know, being that these candidates are running for office, you know, sometimes these things can get really serious. And, you know, you know, I think with this great opportunity to engage with these four candidates, we should ask them some pop questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, Trustee Lindsay? What is your favorite Hawaiian song? Oh, <laughs> my favorite Hawaiian song is Imi Ao Ia Oe. And I especially like that song because my daughter sings it. <laughs> and she always sings it for me. Thank you. Mr. Makeko, what is your favorite Hawaiian yeah, melody? That last night, and I still have to stick to it. I had the greatest kumu ever able to walk this bridge, Mr. John Lake. Oh, yeah. And so every time I would hear him, you know, wake up, wake us up, get up. And go, the next thing you know, you hear, eh, oh, my, eh, oh, my, eh. Well, of course, I got a book thrown in my head because he's like, you're doing it wrong. Stop, chat the words. Don't speak the words. Be a Hawaiian. Do that stuff. And it installs pride in me. But then, of course, I got to just watch the man resignate, hear his pitch. His EK was so awesome. That is always my favorite Hawaiian song. I even play it sometimes to get up out of bed sometimes. Yeah. Mahalo. Mr. Paris? I Love You, sung by the memorable and lovely Auntie Marlene Tsai. Ms. Ryan? Kalama Ula, of course. Uh -oh, yeah. um, that's our family's favorite song. My mom was raised in Kalama Ula. My grandfather was an original lessee of the first Hawaiian homestead mm -hmm. in Kalama Ula. Kainoa, do you have any questions for our lovely candidates? Oh, this is a pop-up on me too, Kamaka. This is a pop-up. <laughs> uh, this might get you in some political hot water, but who was your favorite Miss Aloha Hula? Oh. 
Let's see them squeeze their way out of this. We'll start with Miss Ryan. <laughs> How are we doing? Oh, solid choice. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can have the same Because she's an awesome international uh -huh. businesswoman. And she has chosen to run for office again for a second time. And I wish her well. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Marky Cole. I support the reigning champion. <laughs> Diplomatic oh, <yeah>. answer. <laughs> Trustee. Thank you for supporting the reigning champion. <laughs> it comes from, from Hamaha, by the way. <laughs> your daughter. It comes from our halau, halau oh. nalei kaumaka ouka. Oh. Oh, yeah. My favorite, um, Miss Aloha Hula, is also from our halau, <laughs> and that's Manalani English. Oh. Wow. You know, it's getting to that time, 6.51, and a lot of us are getting hungry. So, Trustee Lindsay, where is your favorite place to eat, and what do you get from my favorite place is Gyotaku on King Street. I love it. You know, I'm what they call a house of wine, okay, because I grew up in a town section. So Wolfgang Steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to know the owner, and we, I've been lobbying him to get paella in there. He's, he's willing. So, but, you know, the, the spinach and mashed potato aside, oh, at age prime with some, oh, winner, buddy, winner. Right on. Mm. My favorite. Thai food is by far Siam Garden on Nimit. Wonderful green papaya salad. <laughs> Gotta go mild though, too hot. <laughs> <laughs> Highway in special soybeans with the lop chong and you know all the drippings. But I also like the lomi ahi from People's Cafe. <laughs> all right, I'm getting hungry. Kainoa, can we go yet? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming here and spending your time with us to tell us why you are running to be an OHA trustee. Um, we do have a little bit of time left, so if uh, each candidate could provide closing remarks that are given at 90 seconds each. So, Mr. Makiko, you will go first. Trustee Lindsay, you will go second. Uh, candidate Ryan, you will be third. And finally, candidate Paris, you will be last. Mr. Makiko. Uh, thank you all for coming out and paying attention. First and foremost, I you know I speak at will. I don't have any preference. I'm happy because I've been in the dance a couple of times. Uh, I know Auntie here is in a different race and she has her own rules and stuff like that. So I'd like to speak to my other two candidates. I'd be very proud, even if I lost, to see one of these two get into office. They demonstrated good leadership, the civility, and the knowledge of the stuff. So if you guys, I wish you the best. I hope you know thank you me. can get in and be great. As far as for myself, um, you know, I'm, I'm out there, I'm accessible, I speak from the hip, and I, I fire from the hip too. I mean, so it's just basically what you see is what you get. Um, I bring a level of professionalism, I think, that is not necessarily seen in the Hawaiian community, but uh, with my temperance, uh, wisdom, and my fortitude to the cause, I think I can bring it back. Not by way of a lawsuit, but by, by, by way of civility and common sense something that we know we have we just have to exercise and bring it back and it's going to take change in order to do that so thank you Mr. thank Michael. you i defer my time trustee Lindsay. well since you've heard most of what i am doing at um, oha i just want to share with you a portion of a speech that i shared in washington dc when i went there this june to drape King Kamehameha uh, with many be beautiful and fragrant lei from our islands. It was with uh, great pride that I shared a brief message on behalf of my fellow trustees with our beneficiaries that live on the continent. As I described in my opinion what made Kamehameha great, I also shared that he let law govern the people moving forward, ushering in a new era. Since the wrongful overthrow of our kingdom's government, and the illegal annexation of our nation, the upward trajectory of our people set in motion by Kamehameha was derailed, leaving our people destitute and our traditions in disarray. But as we decolonize our minds in the margins of society and bring forth what our ancestors have left for us, we thrive once again. So much has been done by our communities to make a better life for our people. For as many years we have been lost, 
we have also been fighting to hold on to what we love and value. Pupukahi i Holomua unite in order to progress. But as far as we have come, the path to complete freedom is still beyond the horizon. There is so much more to do. And as our world has changed, so must our people. The rules have changed, and now we must adapt to ensure our people's survival, secure what is ours, and protect everything that we value. In these trying times with the great needs of our people, may we remember the legacy of Kamehameha, Mo'i o Kalahui, and all of those who helped him achieve self-determination. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Ryan. One of my most proudest moments when my mother was alive was when um, a kupuna came up to her in Friendly Market in Molokai and told her, your daughter remember. Um, what she was referring to was at the time was my strong advocacy questioning Kamehameha schools. At the time, I felt they were excluding the very population that they were meant to serve, and that's the Hawaiian child. With that advocacy, it, I cannot emphasize enough that the most important qualification for trustee is intent and courage. Courage to make the hard decisions, to face our people whether they're angry or not. Do not fear them. With that, we will find solutions and consensus. We have to rise our people together. And remember, everybody votes for OHA. We need everyone's help. When you vote for OHA, you're giving your, your support, expressing your support to help our people. So thank you, and remember to vote in the primary. Aloha. And last, candidate Paris. Mahalo. It really has been a pleasure to sit here with my fellow candidates because it gives me hope. Because I know that the people to my left and to my right care that they have chosen to Owamo Kuleana, that they have chosen to recognize that there is work to be done and that the person that might have that responsibility is that person pointing at yourself, is themselves. So I sit here humbled to be amongst you. As we have all said, OHA needs to address the real needs of Native Hawaiians today, not tomorrow. Auntie, trustees, you guys were successful. You have educated us. You have done well. We have experienced it and we have come back. Now it is our time to come alongside and to kako'o, to support, to hold on to your wisdom and your ike, your knowledge, and to hold on to you as we train the next generation and then we entrust the work to them. This means investing in economic drivers for long-term benefit, seven generations from now, as our ancestors planned before us. Working with fellow trustees, we need to prioritize housing, education, jobs, and health care for Native Hawaiians and all of Hawaii. E ho'ulu lahui aloha. Together, we can grow a flourishing Hawaii for all, and especially caring for our Native Hawaiian brothers and sisters. Together, we will rebuild trust. Mahalo, Makana Paris, Oha trustee at large. Please vote on August 11th. Thank you. Well, kind of, it's about that time. You know, we'd like to thank trustee Lindsay, candidate Makiko, candidate Paris, and candidate Ryan for joining us here tonight and for sharing your manao, your aloha um, for our lahui. And I think that's why we are all here because we all want a flourishing lahui for the next generation. We would also like to thank our audience who are in studio tonight for being here and for taking time to engage and to listen to what these uh, candidates have to say. Kaino, did you have any last mana'o, anything you wanted to share? Yeah, I'd like to mahalo all the folks uh, watching on TV that have tuned in to educate themselves on the Oha race. Uh, which will be critical uh, to the Ho'ulalahui movement. Um, we would like to remind everyone, in the same manner that candidate Makana did, uh, Makana Paris, 
uh, to uh, vote on August 11th uh, in the primary election. Uh, anything else, brother? Everybody can vote for OHA, and I think that's something that should be shared to everyone living here in Hawaii. Last but not least, I would like to thank my lovely co-host, Kainoa, <laughs> for uh, joining me tonight. And a big thanks to Chair Khan and to the oh, um, yeah. other members of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii for their hard work in putting this forum on. Uh, for more information about our caucus, you can visit hawaiianaffairs.org. No leila he wahi mahalo ya oko pakahi a po no ka holo he ana mai ke amo moho. Thank you for joining us here tonight to listen to these four well qualified and lovely OHA trustee candidates. Mahalo. Okay, but don't run away. We got more guys coming up. Huh? Yes, this is just the beginning, so stay tuned. Mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha mai kako. Uh, welcome to the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus of the Democratic Party's OHA Candidate Forum. Um, my name is Davis Price and I'm here with Rebecca Soon. Aloha. Uh, both of us formerly served as executive committee members for the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus and our current president, Lemomi Khan, invited us to come speak and provide some commentary during the breaks while yeah. they reset the uh, Talk set story up there. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So how are you doing? Good, that was exciting. Yeah. I'm waiting for a exciting. little bit more fireworks, though. Maybe in the next two rounds so we'll get some more. You and I both are political, in the political scene, working hard in the community. This is always an exciting sure. time of year, yeah? Election yeah. season. Yes. Comes up every two years. Very little sleep. <laughs> a lot of work, yeah? August 12th, I think I recently said. Oh, yeah? We can sleep on August 12th. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, let's get down to it. Today we're here to hear from our candidates um, that are vying for the seat for Office of Hawaiian Affairs, trustee. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what is the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, what is the trustee position do, and what uh, you know the voters should expect. So let's start off. I want to ask you, Rebecca, um, um, talk a little bit about what OHA's mission is as an organization. Can you share? Yeah. So. Well, we, talk, we heard a little bit about it in the last round, um, the, that Office of Foreign Affairs was established coming out of the 1978 Constitutional Convention. Um, Article 7, Section 5 of our Hawaii State Constitution actually is some of the enabling language where we see the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, and really being about the well-being of Native Hawaiians. But in, and it's really important that we remember the fact that our roots really are in this constitutional obligation that the state of Hawaii has to the Native Hawaiian community. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I think every Native Hawaiian in the state, outside of the state, has um, not also certainly about what it means to ensure the well-being of the Native Hawaiian community. And we talk about well-being, we talk about, you know, so many different forms of sovereignty, economic sovereignty, food sovereignty, political sovereignty, cultural sovereignty, and the, seeing the ways in which Office of Hawaiian Affairs over the years has chosen to empower various areas. And I think a lot of people have mana'o about what OHA should be doing differently, should be doing more, should be doing less, et cetera. So excited to hear more about that throughout the night. Awesome, awesome. Mahalo for sharing. So you brought up something interesting. A lot of people have mana'o about what yes. OHA should be doing. And, you know, just so, you know, you know, but so the public viewers know, I work at OHA. Um, currently working for a trustee that's not up for election no, this year. for your hard work for our community. Uh, man, don't need mahalo. <laughs> but, you know, it is, it is a tough job, and governance is a tough job. And I see people, and I've, and I've worked in and around OHA uh, for the last 15 years almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, anybody that does work in our Hawaiian community, uh, you're going to have some type of connection to OHA at some point, whether it's direct or whether you're doing, you know, a... a, a a fish pond project or a charter school or you know small business development or economic development project Absolutely. you are going to have some type of interface with OHA at some point mm -hmm. so I think that's something important to remember is we may not always see what OHA does mm. we may not always see OHA on the front line but there's some type of connection now whether they're doing it well or not that's where the mana'o part comes in, yeah? Absolutely. Um, so it's important, and, and, and you know, just so I can reflect a little bit on what I believe OHA's mission is, I think you hit on something very important, and that is 
the legal construct of OHA. It was crafted at the Constitutional Convention um, in, in 1978, and it, it is grounded in legal, statutory, and, yes. and constitutional law yes. for Hawaii. Um, it was actually a con based off of uh, the Admission Act, which is basically the federal government mandated that the state of Hawaii serve the Native Hawaiian mm -hmm. people in order for Hawaii yeah. to become a state. As correct? a condition of statehood, condition yeah, in 1959. Yeah. So we hear a lot of talk about constitutionality, buzzwords like race-based, mm. discrimination. Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize that under Hawaii state law, yeah. and that's actually grounded back, you know, go, can tra trace back to kingdom law, OHA has its place, along with our Ali'i trust. Oh, absolutely. Right? Okay. And the kuleana to the Native Hawaiian community is very clear right. in the legal documents, in, but also just in the mission as our community understands it. Right, that right. that kuleana, that's the foundational mission of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And you talked about the role of the trustees. The role of the trustees is really to respect that kuleana, mm -hmm. to fulfill that kuleana, and to work hard every day, as you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, that the staff do in order to fulfill the mission of serving the well-being of the Native Hawaiian people. That's truly the mission. Right, right. And you, you brought it back to why we're here today, which is talking about elections, trustees, the people's yes. choice, the people's opportunity to exercise their voice, raise their leo, vote Fighting. to rise, I believe, is a, the hashtag running. I'm seeing, right? So the role of trustee, um, you know, they, let's talk a little bit about that because a trustee under you know in, in, of any organization mm -hmm. trustees are bound by very strict obligations called mm -hmm. fiduciary duties mm -hmm. correct yeah but you're a graduate of richardson right as are you know. right okay, okay so we know a little Two bit lawyers about up that here. Lot, <laughs> so we so can forgive us we only get a couple <laughs> minutes but we could probably talk here all night but um yeah so fiduciary obligations explain a little bit what what that means so, I mean, fiduciary duties generally um, are responsible for, you know, there's a, there's a trust fund. Mm -hmm. So whether that's made up of a land corpus or whether that's made up of money. Um, and in Oha's case, much of the revenue and much of the budget comes from the public land trust revenue, um, which we heard a little bit about tonight, too. The criticisms about whether or not the state is really um, living up to its, its responsibility for the full share of the Oha's public um, public land trust revenues. But really the the kuleana of fiduciary duty is so it's so simple. It seems to get so complicated, but it's really so simple. It's you have responsibility to the trustees. The trustees have call my responsibility to its beneficiaries. So in any trust, you have a trust, you have some kind of assets, you have trustees who have kuleana to care for those assets, to properly utilize those assets for the betterment of beneficiaries. So it's all about the beneficiaries. And in this case, our beneficiaries are our Native Hawaiian community. And it's so clear that the kuleana really is about serving the Native Hawaiian community, being responsible. So all the things that you would expect someone to be responsible if they were holding your money, mm -hmm. if they were holding right, your right. land, if they were holding things that really belong to you in you know, their accounts, how right. would you want them to spend that? How would you want them to care for you, making decisions that are in line with that? Right, right, right. Oh, that's a great explanation, far okay. better than I could do. Sorry, <laughs> law professors. But, um, <laughs> so in addition to that fiduciary obligation, you know, OHA has a unique mission. So you have this trust, assets, mm -hmm. financial, there's, there's cash, money, there's a portfolio, and there's land assets, but there's also this mission to advocate to, you know, betterment of the condition of Native Hawaiian people. Um, there's real specific language that actually goes even, in my opinion, mm. beyond just the management of the asset. You know, the kuleana is very, very great. It's very large. It's a huge burden. So, you know, for me, um, I, 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 you nailed the, the financial fiduciary obligations, um, but there's also a, a, a commitment to Native Hawaiians. Oh, absolutely. There's a commitment to our lahui, um, our people, in that, um, it, again, goes beyond the management of assets. It goes into identity. It goes into, and this is actually what probably brings up a lot of debate, right? Because yeah. the, the priorities could be different. Absolutely. You know, um, and, and it could be, you know, creating jobs. It mm -hmm. could be affordable housing. It could be em uh, emphasis on culture, language, sure. identity issues, right? And that's where I think we see a lot of differences of opinion, which is great. Absolutely. And we have to embrace that. And, and the hard part about being a trustee is you have to balance that. 
yeah. right? And, and, and it's a tough job. Yeah. I give these guys credit. Who's and, running? You know, I mean, you talk about diversity of opinion. We have over 500,000 members of the Native Hawaiian community today. Right. And so we're, you know, we're not one amorphous body of people. I think some mm -hmm. people maybe get frustrated at times that, oh, how come they cannot get along? But, you know, that's a real shallow understanding mm -hmm. about our community because we're so diverse. Yeah. We're in different economic stations. We live in different places. We have different genealogies, different moku that we're from, different kuleana that we all that we all have to live towards. And so, yeah, we have different opinions as to where where resources should go but yes you're right I mean the ultimately every single action that's taken by a trustee should be in furtherance of what's the what's in the well-being of our people right right yeah um, so we kind of went through the nitty-gritty you know for the average voter let's say the person who who doesn't engage in projects where they may see OHA's influence um, that doesn't watch the OHA board meetings that yeah. doesn't read civil bead and honolulu advertiser political pieces all the time what what do you think would make it important for the average you know non politically you know engaged i don't want to say engaged but just people work they got lives they raise yeah. families it takes a lot of you know the amount of time it takes to become well versed in and really get into the the weeds on a lot of these topics you know for those folks that don't have time to do that that, that are busy living check to check paying the bills why why is this election important in your mind you know <laughs> at the end of the day i think people just fundamentally are trying to survive are trying to take care of their kuleana mm -hmm. um and so i think that most people are looking for trustees who understand them who understand the real struggles that they're going through in their community in their ohana um who just care i mean fun right. like let's just start at the basics like do you just fundamentally care mm -hmm. about the issues that our community are facing yeah. that's i think a real basic thing and i think that that voters tend to that's a real like no i'll check right like oh do i feel like this person cares or do i not feel like and that's why engaging is so important and it's hard for most voters to engage one-on-one, -on -one, but that's why forums like this hopefully allow people the opportunity right. to connect a little bit more, you know, going to out in the community. That's why, you know, knocking on doors has such a high conversion rate. Mm -hmm. It's the highest conversion rate of any other form of, of uh, voter contact because when somebody meets you, aloha, alo, I mean, we understand this is human nature. You connect with that person, you understand them. So I do, I think like basically people just want to know that, that these candidates care. Um, I think that some folks are looking for candidates that really understand what the kuleana is, have maybe some ideas about how to fulfill that kuleana. Um, and then I think that, you know, just like how we care about all the things that are happening in our community, we, I think that, that our Hawaiian community wants OHA to be, you know, you talked about OHA is doing so many things and OHA is involved in so, so many spaces that we're not always aware of. And I think that our community wants OHA to be involved, right. wants to know about OHA's involvement, wants to see that in their lives. And so I think that being involved this election, I mean, every election is important, right? We talk about voting being so critical, but this election, um, the, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, you know, is such an important piece. It has so much capacity to make difference within our communities. We talk about the grants, we talk about some of the operations, some of the advocacy that OHA does. That stuff touches Hawaiian community. Right. Oha was one of the joiners in um, Navai Eha. Right. Oha made a big difference in, in Navai Eha, um, in my read at least from the outside right. looking right. in. Um, yeah. Oha is a part of so many communities' lives, and so the power that the agency has, we got to have people at the helm that right. care, right. that understand the mission to serve right. Native Hawaiians, right. that want to do that. Right. That's what we really need. <clears throat> you brought up something important, and that, that is. Uh, some of the things that OHA has been involved with that people may not know. Yeah. <clears throat> that actually touched a lot of people. Navai Eha, the case on Maui to restore stream flow. Mm -hmm. Kalo farmers fought for that for years against large corporations, right, that were controlling the, the resources. Um, OHA did play a significant in, in role in that, actually, that ongoing battle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's been a piecemeal 20 years now, I believe it's yeah. um, Hawaiian education movement, OHA had played a key role in that. Some of these trustees that are still on the board were there in the 90s when OHA made the decision to make huge investments into yeah. Hawaiian education, Hawaiian language education, Hawaiian charter school education, um, Hawaiian charter schools. Yeah. Um, so, and all those things touch a lot, thousands, Absolutely. thousands of Hawaiians yeah. and, and non-Hawaiians. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Mahalo. Um, you know, I want to make, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, real fast, I mean, unfortunately, 
in Hawaii, probably in lots of other places, but you know, we're focused on our, our kuleana here. In Hawaii, people are struggling, mm -hmm. and I think overall frustrated with mm -hmm. politics. And so we really don't take the time to get to understand the issues. And right. so we talk sometimes in political spheres, you know, we talk like this often, mm -hmm. about top ballot versus bottom of the ballot, right? Mm -hmm. And we have so many top ballot races this year. We have governor, we have lieutenant governor, we have Congress, we have so many people that are then running within our communities. You know, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs race, unfortunately, so many people, I think, don't take the time to understand candidates um, and really end up voting on names. So Right, and you bring up a good we point. We gotta get away and, from and, that. And we have long breaks that we have to talk. Oh my gosh, we have, sorry, we have one I know. More. No, no, no. So we guys. have a lot to fill, <laughs> and you know what? That's a good topic that we can take up in the next. Okay, go for it. Break, but I want to make sure we talk about the the actual elections themselves. Yeah. Before we get into the next segment, and so this is the primary election. This is the pri we got even more time to talk now. <laughs> we All have right. like signals. What did you switch? <laughs> Click. Okay. Uh. Wait, wait, wait. Can we break it up real fast? What? They, the um. The last panel asked what um, favorite Hawaiian song, oh. and then favorite food, and mm. what's other favorite? One more oh, favorite. No. I didn't hear that. What was it? Okay, so favorite oh. food. Okay, well let's stick with the easy ones for now. Favorite food and favorite Hawaiian song. Go. Favorite food. Was that that's the question? Tough. You okay. know, okay. that's I don't know why it's so hard to answer. <laughs> what do you mean? Because food, like, it's like so important to us. Honestly, anything. Uh, Luau. Yeah, okay. Luau stew, yeah. kalo, yeah. koi, yeah. paiai. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's really the comfort food, mm -hmm. beef stew. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just I could probably name like five right <laughs> off. Anyway, so, and favorite Hawaiian song, yeah. probably Kalihua Emilia, sung mm. by a number of people. Favorite Beautiful. version is my grandmother's. She Aww. kills that song. So, yeah. Anyway. So, next break, you're going to sing? Oh, negative. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Everybody's going to turn the channel. <laughs> Everyone has to like live message in for Davis to sing, okay? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go What's with anything you? that you can dip in poi. Mm. So, I mean, I dip some weird stuff. Kimchi. Oh, that's good. Pineapple. That's good too. All kind. Anything you can dip in poi. And my favorite Hawaiian song uh, is definitely Kalamaula. And that's oh. just, I mean, roots. George you know? Tom's version? I mean, honestly, every version is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna right lie, on. but right on, right on. yeah, George Helm, you gotta keep it original. Oh, I know, so. all day. But for real, I mean, DHHL, you know, first homestead. Right, they, right, right. they set the pathway for generations. So right on, right on. Okay, so, back to serious. Back into stuff. the nitty gritty, uh, and I'm gonna try to make this simple. Oha elections, probably another reason why we have a lot of issues. It, it, it's kind of complicated. Um, so there's nine seats on the Oha board. Um, this year, five of those seats are up for election. So on August 11th, we have the primary election, and that's going to narrow down the number of candidates for the general election, which will happen in November. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I believe all of the primary candidates listed for the th five seats were invited to this. Um, they were, yeah. Um, and, and, and today, mo Momi's on it. Yes. So uh, some did not, weren't, weren't able to attend, but uh, we got a good turnout. Um, I believe there's four or five candidates in each uh, session. So the seats that are up this year are the Oahu seat, uh, which is currently vacant, uh, formerly held or currently held by uh, Trustee Peter Apol, who will not be running. And there are seven candidates uh, running for that seat. So after the primary, the purpose of the primary is to narrow this race down to two. Mm -hmm. So whoever the candidates, the top two candidates will move on to the general and then we'll get, probably get to do this again. Great. Um, and then the Maui seat, they're uh, currently held by Trustee Carmen Hulu Lindsay, and there are two candidates for that seat. Um, again, actually, so that one, we're going to see the same two candidates all the way through. So they've got a long haul ahead of them. Uh, the at-large one, this is where it gets kind of complicated. There are three at-large seats open, and uh, yeah, three at-large seats up this year. Um, those seats are currently held by Trustees Le'ahu Isa, uh, Trustee John Waihe'e, and Trustee Rowena Akana. There are 15 candidates running for those three seats. So this one's important. The voters have, can make up to three choices in the primary. After the primary, six, the top six vote-getters will move on. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll probably be back here. Yeah. Maybe we do such a bang-up job, Hawaii News now ask us what come over. <laughs> yeah. We can rock and roll. I anyway, I think our time <laughs> is wrapping up, and we're going to get into the next round of candidates.
which we should have had a list here of names, but <laughs> they'll know. They'll they know everything right inside on. the studio. Mahalo. Mahalo. <laughs> And welcome, thank you, and welcome to this evening's second session of the OHA Trustee Candidates Forum. My name is Lemomi Khan. I'm chair of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. And my name is Rayton Varis, vice chair of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. For those just joining the forum this evening, we'd like to briefly share with you information about the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. It is an entity of the Democratic Party of Hawaii, and we exist to address issues like self-determination, protection of Hawaiian cultural practices and sacred sites, pono economic development, protection of Hawaii's natural resources, the aina and the kai, housing, health, and education. We do this work through educational forums like this evening and through legislative advocacy. Recognizing that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs election is a nonpartisan race and all registered voters in the state of Hawaii can vote for the OHA trustee positions, the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus uh, hopes that tonight's forum will educate uh, you, the voters, on issues of key importance to the Native Hawaiian community so that informed decisions uh, on voting for the right candidate will happen. Earlier, we heard uh, from candidates Carmen Hulu Lindsay, Makana Paris, Pohai Ryan, and Kelly Imake Kao. In this session, our guests are Kalea Kaka and Jackie Burke, who are running for the Oahu resident seat, C. Kawi Amsterdam, and Landon Paikai, uh, who are running for one of three OHA at large seats. The 8.30 to 9.30 session uh, will feature uh, other candidates. They include Trustee Le Ahu Isa, Will William Isla Jr., and Brendan Kale Ainali, who are running for three OHA at large seats as well as Esther Kia Aina and Samuel Wilder King, who are running for the Oahu seat. Candidates will be given two minutes to provide opening remarks, followed by an opportunity to answer questions concerning fiscal management responsibility, governance, and delivery of programs and services to Native Hawaiians, and then provide closing remarks. Our moderators this evening for this session are Ken Kiyoho Kapu Farm, and Jean Iida. Jean represents Maui as she resides on that island, so she res represents Maui on our Hawaiian Affairs Caucus Executive Committee. Our timekeeper is Melody Aduha, mahalo Melody. And so we're ready to go. Uh, Ken, Jean, e holomua. Aloha, we begin with opening remarks of two minutes each by each candidate, may we start with candidate Kalea Kaka, uh, followed by candidate Jackie Burke and candidate uh, Kawi, uh, C. Kawi Johanan Amsterdam and candidate Leiden uh, Paikai. Uh, OHA Fiscal Management Responsibilities, you have one minute uh, to each give your, I'm sorry, your opening statement. Okay. Aloha, my name is Kalea Kaka and I'm running for the OHA trustee Oahu Island seat. I would like to thank the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus, Olelo Community Media, the candidates, all present, and the viewers tuning in. In this forum, you're going to hear a lot of different ideas from each of the candidates about what they would like to do. And what I would like to do is focus on getting people to work together. This is the time in which we strive for the goal of unity, in which we stand, rise, and move forward together as a unified voice, one voice. And your voice is important. The voice of many to move towards workable solutions is key. My goal for OHA, state agencies and organizations, is to synergize together and work to achieve common goals. As an OHA trustee, I will apply values learned. Remember, I'm doing things with the spirit of aloha. Applying my educational foundation and experience working within the community in education, and at the Hawaii State Legislature in both the House and Senate and Senate Committees on Higher Education and Judiciary and Government Operations. 
with my dedication and commitment to meet the challenges of a trustee, I will keep in mind the goodness of our traditions, seeking wisdom of those before us, to blend with the fresh perspective to OHA representing a new generation, with a strong sense of being global citizens, wanting to help Hawaiians succeed, making Hawaii a better and productive place for all Hawaii. I would like to humbly ask for the opportunity to continue my Ohana's legacy of service. Please remember to shaka and vote akaka. Aloha, I'm Amsterdam the man. Kaui Yohanan Amsterdam. I ask for your vote to be a trustee at large uh, in OHA. My main purpose is to advance our Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian people. Uh, when we were uh, with uh, or a part of the last uh, Constitution Convention, a main purpose was to discuss the issues of common concern and to facilitate the process of um, self-determination leading to self-government. And so my purpose is to advance self-government so that we can advance in what's called the uh, social uh, determinants of uh, health, education, culture, economic development, aina, and governance being the umbrella over everything. Uh, because of our cultural uh, inadequacy that resulted uh, due to the uh, loss or suspension of our kingdom as part of our culture, um, we, we had undermined these, um, dis the, the uh, special social determinants that I had spoken about. A psychological aspect of that was the uh, self-image and self-identity uh, uh, of Native Hawaiians. Uh, this resulted in a great cultural uh, loss for us, uh, a, a disruption of our cultural practices, as found by OHA in its uh, research. It is my goal to be able to restore and to advance our uh, governing entity so that we can uh, strengthen and bring back and restore these uh, social uh, aspects or these uh, social determinants in order to be a great people, a great Hawaiian nation, a, a, a people, a great Hawaiian people again with the help of Keakua. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Jackie Kaho'o Kelly Burke. I'm running for the OHA trustee for the island of Oahu. I have a master's in public health and a master's in urban and regional planning. I worked at the Department of Health in the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, which gives me insight to some of the uh, uh, drug abuse problems and tobacco problems we have. Then I worked for the Department of Transportation Harbors Division, and I was a planner in the engineering department for the super ferry. So I do understand transit and transportation issues and the challenges that we face. I um, have served over in over 30 boards and I started off after graduating from Kamehameha the first 10 years of my life traveling throughout the islands and I can compare you know what has happened in the last 30 to 40 years on Maui uh, from the development of Kihei uh, to Kauai and the development of Hanalei. I can look at uh, Kailua Kona and Waikoloa. I can see all of these changes. The next 10 years, um, I went into media. I was a TV producer. I did the first arthritis telethon in Hawaii. I worked in broadcasting. I worked at KCCN Radio, and then I worked for print. Uh, and eventually, I did publish my own newspaper. The last 10 years, I went back to school, and I had two young daughters, and I earned my two masters. It took me 10 years to do that. But it was my passion, and I had two children to raise. And I did that for my children and to better myself. I also um, have my own businesses. I have owned businesses. I've been an entrepreneur. I started the Breakfast in Bed, Breakfast in Bed Catering Company. I have uh, been an independent publisher. And currently, as an entrepreneur, I own the TAP National League Billiards. So I do shoot pool. Uh, I think that makes me a pretty rounded, well-rounded trustee. And all joking aside, though, I'm very serious about the issues that are facing us today in the Hawaiian community. I feel that 
the transparency is a very important issue. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Landon Paikai, and I'm a candidate for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, trustee at large. I'm the oldest child born to, I'm the oldest of five children born to Lee J. Manuwai Paikai and Laura Malua'ali'i Kamalani. My wife Sarah and I have been married for 11 years, and together we have four beautiful children, Kalino, Ka'elele, Kaha'i, and Ha'ale. I'm running to bring integrity back to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and more importantly, to connect our people to the resources they desperately need and deserve by providing accountable, collaborative, transparent, and innovative opportunities now. As far as experience, I currently work as a youth counselor with at-risk youth, 50% of those who are Native Hawaiian or are a part Hawaiian. I also work as a part-time teacher at a local high school teaching graphic design and I am also a business owner. And I chose these career paths so that I could focus my energies on the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I participate as a beneficiary at the board level. I go to as many board meetings as I can and testify on the behalf of our beneficiaries, advocating on their behalf as well. And more importantly, it's not the seat that, that fuels me. It's the opposite side. It's making the decisions. It's providing, again, those opportunities for our people to advance, to feel empowered. Because at this point in time, they do not feel empowered. They feel desperate. They, are, they feel hungry, hungry for change. And this is the great opportunity that we have. We have an opportunity to put in five new trustees. Five new trustees. Imagine the kind of power that is. You got nine trustees, five. That's a great opportunity. So I encourage you guys to vote. Mahalo for the time. Okay. Regarding OHA fiscal management responsibilities, we have two questions for you. By way of background, the Hawaii State Constitution, Article 7, Section 6, provides that the OHA board shall exercise power as provided by law to manage and administer the proceeds from the sale or other disposition of the lands, natural resources, minerals, and income derived from whatever sources for Native Hawaiians and Hawaiians, including all income and proceeds from that prorata portion of the public trust referred to in Section 4 of Article 7 for Native Hawaiians. Question 1. This year, the State Attorney General issued two reports of their audit of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Both reports found the need for improvement in the management and administration of the OHA funds, specifically the AG found problems with the approval and accountability process for spending OHA income. If elected as an OHA trustee, how will you assure that income is properly spent and that the OHA administrator, staff, and trustees themselves are held accountable. You have one minute to this question. Candidate Burke, would you begin? Yes. Uh, historically, the CEO was not a position. It was an administrator. And somehow, in my opinion, currently, it's in a lopsided uh, arrangement of power. I don't believe that the, the administrator is an elected position, but a lot of decisions are going through his office. I also propose that we go back to having advisory committees uh, way back when we did have groups of community leaders and experts would, you know, in every health, education, or finance be able to give advice um, into running the affairs of OHA. And then if you were talking about accountability, when you have an outside advisory board, there's probably more of a chance to offer uh, input and also to review some of the upcoming decisions in, in a physical manner or spending um, and also holding accountability of staff uh, for their actions or hiring practices. Candidate Amsterdam? Simply, um, the audit could take place internally by an external auditor of OHA and also the state could run their audit. 
But that's not really the, the issue, I think. The issue is, why do we have to be accountable to the state? Um, this displacement that I talked about, the social determinants that have been undermined, have left us in a position in which we have to be accountable to the state, to the federal government. And I already mentioned the simple ways that we could do that. But the overall uh, solution, I think, is that we should take back our own accountability. And we can do that with our own internal audit. And rather than have the state do it, why not have maybe the finance department of our um, governing entity do it? And then we would become more self-determined. So I think that is the real issue here. Why can't we account for our own accountability? Thank you. Candidate uh, Akaka. Um, in an ad hoc committee on OHA policies co-chaired by trustees Hulu Lindsay and Peter Poe, they proposed sweeping changes and spending policies. However, it was never placed on the agenda for discussion and action. I recommend there be a public disclosure of that report and recommendations. The proposed recommendations addressed many of the complaints that were filed by the, by the Ethics Commission and on how OHA was spending its money. If I'm elected, I would strive to revive this document and take action on it, as I believe there needs to be um, infrastructure put into place where there's uh, clear guidelines as to what is allowed and what is not allowed. And uh, candidate uh, Pai Kai. Mahalo for the question. In regards to the audit, again, it was by the Office of the Auditor, and what they presented was, we know, or, or maybe you don't know, that every four years, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs go, goes through an audit. And every four years, they, get, they have an opportunity to not necessarily come clean, but to be transparent about what's happening. And they are transparent. If you go to OHA.org, you have financial documents that you can go and look at. And maybe you might not be savvy, but that's an opportunity for you to see how, how it's going. So as a trustee, it's really about keeping ourselves accountable and transparent about what is happening at the board level and making sure that we are following the proper policies and procedures. These things are already in place, and they have... The auditor just really pointed out the flaws in the system. So it's really a matter of going in and tweaking those things like a car. You go in, you tweak certain things, and the car runs at, at its optimum. That's the same exact thing that needs to be done to, in regards to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs model. Question number two. The state's obligation to Native Hawaiians is firmly established in our Constitution. How the state satisfies that constitutional obligation because policy decisions that are primarily within the authority and expertise of the legislative branch. One of the policy decisions is the amount to be transferred to the OHA from the public lands. More than a decade has passed since the enactment of Act 178, Session Laws of Hawaii 2006, that set an annual interim figure of 15,100,000. Over the last few years, bills have been introduced to require that government officials study and make written recommendations on the proposed annual amount of interim income and pro proceeds from the public land trust that the Office of Hawaiian Food shall receive annually. In spite of the efforts to get all parties to the table, little progress has been made to have this issue addressed. If elected, as an OHA trustee, what strategy would you advocate to get the state to update the annual amount of income proceeds from the public land trusts due to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs? Um, let's start out with, you have one minute for this question, uh, candidate Amsterdam. You notice how it's the public lands. Originally it was the crown lands, then it was the ceded lands, meaning transferred to the federal government, then it was transferred to the state, now it's the public lands. The solution is to bring those lands back under the control of the Hawaiian people through the governing entity. So you see how important it is? This is just uh, a symptom of the discrepancy and the loss that happened with the loss of our uh, governing entity. Uh, therefore, I would uh, propose and commit myself to bring back under the control of the Hawaiian people or we're going to lose more, more of our resources so we can control uh, the, uh, the crown lands. It's not public lands, it's crown lands. But see, as time goes on, these things change, and we become so used to it that we accept it. Now is the time so we can stop this and bring back our own self-determination and so our Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian people can be great again. That's my 
a commitment to do. Thank you. Candidate uh, Pai Pai? Model for the question. <clears throat> In regards to the Public Land Trust, it's, it's really about advocating on behalf of what is, what is deemed ours. So OHA put a study out, and this can be found at OHA, on OHA.org, called Justice Delayed is Justice Denied. And it talked about the, the reality of what we're facing, what we're faced with currently. So you talked about $15.1 million, and it was supposed to be, you were supposed to be getting 20%. Now, the revenue has changed, and there are millions of dollars at stake now. So right now, realistically, the $15.1 million represents about 4% of what we should be getting. So we should be getting roughly, I mean, there's a lot that we need to be, that we need to be funded for. As a trustee, it continues to be my, my mission to advocate on behalf of those, but also the public in general needs to understand what is at stake here. Our, our Native Hawaiian beneficiaries need to go to the legislature and fight on their behalf. And then at the trustee level, we need to also create policies that will continue to be introduced at the legislature that we can push forward. Mahalo. Uh, candidate Burke. Well, 20% of inventory and that's always been another problem. What is the inventory of seeded lands? So you can make up an arbitrary figure like 15 million, which is what they did back then. And there was a struggle back then to even determine an amount. And so OHA settled for an amount, which was 15 million, not even including a 2% raise every year. Now, I agree with, um, with Pai Kai about that inventory and that 20%. As a trustee, it's a very serious and very hard battle that has to be done on a very continuous basis. It's a legislative battle. It's a policy battle. It's a public relations battle. You know, and the push to get an inventory. There have been so many inventories done, and none of those reports published. The Center for Hawaiian Studies did one. I think OHA did one. I think another guy was paid to do one and didn't turn in a report. We have to be accountable for these reports. We have to be accountable. We have to know our inventory of seeded lands. That is one of the first things as a trustee that I intend to do is to get that inventory on file, on data, and a an estimate of what the value of that is. Canada Kaka. Um, I agree a lot with what both of you say. Um, this tries to get answered every legislative session. And what we're finding is that um, the revenues received annually are underreported. Mm -hmm. So looking at that, OHA doesn't receive the whole 20%. And uh, this, with this, we need to look at a reliable and certifiable process that we can um, this can be validated and therefore then the money can be saved or spent to improve the quality of life of our Native Hawaiians. But uh, again, I think going back to what you folks are saying that it's up, you know, it is up to the legislature, however, it is up to the voice of the community mm -hmm. to put forth the importance asking our legislators to identify this and do the right thing. Okay, um, moving on, we'll be moving on to programs and services of Native Hawaiians. Uh, each candidate will be given, was given a list of four questions that they were asked to select two concerning programs and services to Native Hawaiians. Candidate Baikai chose to answer the first question, which is, as the candidate for trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, do you agree with the current approach of grants to organizations to deliver programs and services to Native Hawaiians? If yes, why do you believe the approach is effective? If not, what approach would you advocate? You have 60 seconds to answer this question. Mahalo for the question. So it's a yes and a no. And <laughs> the reason why it's a yes is because there are a lot of opportunities for the Office of Warren Affairs to empower and strengthen our people through a lot of the different agencies that are out there. Secondarily, the reason why it's a no is that there are a lot of organizations who are not necessarily Hawaiian organizations who are helping our people. And this is not a bad thing. For me, it's really about empowering our Hawaiian organizations who are out there. I had a great conversation yesterday with someone who works over at Ho'olu Aina who lost some funding recently. And I was miffed about that. How can we, how can we 
take that away from organizations like this who have, that was created for our Hawaiian people and give it to organizations. And this is not a race conversation. It really is about empowering our people to take that step of creating nonprofits, to take that step of creating businesses that we as a, as a trust can fund. And it, it really is about empowering us at all levels. Mahalo for that question. Thank you. Um, second question was chosen in response to by uh, candidate Akaka. The question is regarding health and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Issued two reports recently, one on the health of Native Hawaiian men and the other on the health of Native Hawaiian women. Additionally, OHA has testified on numerous occasions about the impact of social determinants on Native Hawaiian health. If elected as trustee, what kinds of programs and services would you advocate to improve the health of Native Hawaiians? Uh, we'll start with Candidate Akaka. You have 60 seconds to ask this question, followed by Candidate Burke. I think the key here is partnerships to not duplicate what already exists um, and what's already provided. I believe OHA can continue through grant need further leverage OHA money, provide financial support, and partner with and empower community-based organizations that provide health services to Native Hawaiians. OHA can support programs that educate on food choices and options along with nutritional facts and health benefits that are um, that are consumed daily and um, consistently with food and drink. Um, OHA can support programs on where food comes from. Where it, I think it can start in the school system. That we do have programs already out there in the public public schools, and one of them being VEGU, having worked at the Hawaii Agricultural Foundation and um, in the Department of Education, I saw the power and benefit of teaching children where their food comes from, to grow it and gain an appreciation and learn the value of the food. Otherwise, what we know is simply what is served or what we order. This way, children can know the health benefits and also gain a ap full appreciation of what their food is. Kenny Burke? Well, you know, I have a master's in public health, and the Native Hawaiian health is very, very you know, dear to my heart. Um, there is a Native Hawaiian Care Act that sets up five clinics um, under Papa Ola Lokahi. It goes out into the community and addresses some of these things, and some of it is, you know, uh, maternal health, um, child and maternal health, um, prenatal care, and all these issues. So in order to, and I read the women's report and I read the men's report, and I was really impressed with that information and that data. And it's not old news, it's kind of a reoccurring saying that it's still here. For the Connies, um, you know, it's also the loss of the male role culturally. Uh, and for the Wahinis, I think it's not being able to nurture the culture instinct of of what a Hawaiian woman is. Now you got to remember the Polynesian men and women voyaged together. They didn't leave their women at home. So I think more continued efforts through these two reports will um, build out more support because it's already there on the table. Question number three was chosen for response by both candidate uh, Burke and Paikai. The question is regarding the homeless Native Hawaiians are at the top of the list of those homeless in our state. If elected as trustee, what kind of programs and services would you advocate to help Native Hawaiians who are homeless? Also, in what ways can OHA help to assure that Native Hawaiians have access to affordable housing? Candidate Burke, you're first. Well, you know, I, I'm really proud. I belong to the Hawaii uh, community. Community Development Corp, and we were able to build 44 units, uh, Makana Onana Kuli. And through this uh, partnership, which is an ex excellent example of what OHA can partner in, we were able to sell tax credits to Morgan Stanley, and I think we raised four to six million dollars. We were able to get the urban, um, not the urban, but the uh, rural um, agency to attach a subsidy to each rental unit. We were able to take homeless off the beach, and we looked around and we saw a grandma with four children, um, but we were able to take a portion of her uh, Social Security. I think she had 300 a month, and for $100 a month, she could raise her grandchildren. So I know examples exist, and that OHA should be a partner in this. 
and that there is another project coming up and we should have more projects because we're doing affordable rentals. We have to look at spatial control. We have to get away from trying to be individual owners and be shared owners. And that can be problem solving solutions uh, in our housing and our homeless. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Paikai. Mahalo for the question. <clears throat> I chose this, this question specifically because when in the community talking to the beneficiaries, this is the struggle that they adhere to the most, or that is most relevant to them. And it really comes down to financial literacy and financial education and being prepared to actually purchase a home. Uh, many times, Hawaiians who are on the list who are ready to, to purchase or get the call that you got a lot waiting, they're not ready. And so first of all, what we need to do is, as soon as you apply, they should offer classes for, for them. And this is in collaboration with OHA. This is in collaboration with DHHL, with different elite trusts. That's just one way. Another way is to actually develop our Hawaiian homelands with uh, kupuna housing, with multi multi-family homes, multi-family dwellings, with a condo, Condo, condos, condominiums, apartments, those type town, town homes. Those are the types of things that I would love to live in. I, and then you can create community gardens and so many other different things. And there are so many different options that we, that we have available. My time has come up, but we can talk about that a little bit more later. Mahalo. Thank you. Question number four, regarding education. Native Hawaiians have scored disproportionately lower than non-Hawaiians on standardized tests. As an elected OHA trustee, what is your opinion about the cause of this low performance on standardized educational tests? And what programs or services would you advocate to facilitate David, Native Hawaiians doing better on educational tests? Candidate Akaka, thank you for choosing this question to answer. You have 60 seconds. The good, new, the good news is that OHA has consistently um, supported 13 um, public 13 Hawaiian public charter schools with thousands of dollars and continued, can continue to do so. Education of, the, of children is the primary responsibility of the state. OHA's role has been to support public policy that benefits Hawaiians and therefore benefits everyone as well. OHA can continue its support of, of improving public education through the legislature. If OHA can find ways to support public education where there are high numbers of Native Hawaiian families such as Waianae, Nanakuli, Waimanalo, and take a hard look at each of the Hawaiian Islands, I think that's very key. Another example would be to support, um, would be supporting boys and girls clubs in these communities. And th these are the kinds of groups that provide after school programs, provide mentorship and leaders for our, for our keiki to look up to. So, moving on to governance. Um, um, uh, Ken, I didn't yes. have uh, two of my questions on education and health. Okay. Uh, so, uh, maybe I'll just combine them uh, both because they're both related. Uh, in terms of uh, health, we've already determined that uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has these programs, these health programs that we can utilize, and we should let our uh, Native Hawaiian people know they exist. At the same time, the educational programs, charter schools, et cetera, exist, as Sister had mentioned here. Uh, in terms of education also, uh, I've, I've uh, um, gone to 11 colleges uh, and, uh, and also institutes, both in Hawaii, uh, America, e uh, Europe, and the Middle East, uh, in Israel. And uh, I've been uh, the CEO of three uh, uh, humanitarian organizations. I also um, organized seven uh, restoration conferences here. I was uh, an, uh, an officer in the uh, uh, interim government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and I've been uh, also a minority recruiter at the School of Dentistry uh, at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco. Um, I also know that we can develop what's called the Educational Achievement uh, Program, in which we help um, primary, secondary, and post-secondary students with tutorials and resources so they can get through their education. Um, uh, being in, uh, being in post-secondary uh, education, I could see that uh, minorities were admitted, but they had difficulty in getting through. So you need tutorials, and this program could help. But mainly, it's the loss of our governing entity that has left us as Native Hawaiians. It says, I'm Hawaiian. Our self-identity and self-image has been weakened. And these uh, uh, social determinants have been undermined. 
unempowerment, as Brother has mentioned, has resulted in marginalization has occurred. So we are marginalized. We should be the landlords of the Crown Lands and we shouldn't go to the state in order to ask for our own money. So the important thing is I commit to advancing our governing entity, whether it be a kingdom, it be a governing entity, in order to bring back our self-identity, increase it, self-image, and to make Native Hawaiians great and, a, and actually a primary, a central, major um, a major force in Hawaii, America, and throughout the world. I'm a Native Hawaiian, and I'm also a, 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 a Jew, and I'll elicit the help of our um, uh, an Israeli Jews to help us in terms of self-determination and governance, and also in agriculture. With the grace of uh, Akua, Te Akua, mahalo. Thank you all. Um, so we are now moving on to governance, as was mentioned before. Um, the key goal of the OHA Strategic Plan of 2010-2018 is to facilitate a process that would give Hawaiians the opportunity to create a governing entity which would define Native Hawaiians as a political rather than racial group. The benefits of such a governing entity would be its ability to provide Native Hawaiians with greater control over their destiny as they move forward towards self-determination and self-sufficiency. If elected as an OHA trustee, how would you advance this goal and how would you provide funding to enable achievement f of this goal? You have uh, 60 seconds to answer, so can we start out with candidate Pai Kai? Mahalo for the question. In regards to this, this question of, of governance, it's really a matter of allowing the people to have free choice, free reign, and to decide where, where it is that they want to go. Now OHA can collaborate uh, or facilitate the collaboration and facilitate that and advocate where they want to go. But OHA doesn't necessarily have to uh, govern those things. It's really a, a matter of what the people want to do and, and how to go about it. We wasted a lot of money already. And second, secondly, this is coming to an end. The strategic plan is coming to an end, the end of this year, and we need to be focusing on what's going to take us forward. And governance is probably not necessarily one of those things that, that you can do, and, and maybe it is. But again, it's going to be up to the people and how we can better utilize. And in this strategic plan, we need to incorporate the people and let them voice their opinions on how they want to move forward. And then we can talk about how do we fund it? How do we work in collaboration with other organizations to make this thing a, a reality? Mahalo. Uh, can we also have candidate Burke, please? All right. Several years ago, about 10 years ago, I came up with this idea that I would like to see OHA do called the Sovereignty Buses. Now, this is a follow-up of the, the petition against annexation. And these buses would be outfitted with educational material, and they would go out into the community. So we're not calling them to come to a meeting. We're going out to meet them. And with the buses, we are going to have entertainment and stew and rice because this is a family event. And through the sovereignty buses, it would be an education of all the models of governance, independence, tribal recognition, which I'm not against, uh, laws of the kingdom, examples of other um, Pacific nations that have become independent. And then I propose that we also put these buses into uses and that we also send some up to the, the continent to educate those Hawaiians up there. And then in the final is the caravan driving all the way up to Washington, D.C., inviting other Native tribes to join us and deliver the final message of our decision of sovereignty. Um, candidate Akaka. Um, an option is to look at... Um, figuring out a way to support this student education program. So I think that it's important for the community to know what the benefits are in having this. So I believe that Hawaiians need to have the opportunity to vote on this, whether it be um, a Hawaiian, Hawaiians only referendum. But there is a group of Hawaiian leaders, uh, Governor Waihe'e, Senator Bukud Galateria, um, OHA candidate Lee, and they've been working on this to fundraise money to fund a Hawaiian-only referendum vote. My, my beloved and dearest pa, U.S. Senator Daniel Kaka, fought for many years in Congress to give Hawaiians the opportunity to vote on this, to give the Hawaiians an identity 
and to identify their rights as Hawaiians. Um, in the past, I've spoken to my grandfather about what the Akaka Bill means, what it means for the Hawaiian people, and what it means for the people of Hawaii, for America. And what it came down to is productivity. When the Hawaiian people rise, all of Hawaii benefits. Can I, can I, can I answer them? Oh, mahalo. Um, as I've mentioned, um, to be able to have our governing, cultural governing self-entity is the key and the, the foundation of everything we're talking about. And if we don't, it, everything's all fragmented. Um, my mother, Mama Loa, uh, Leilani Hia'aklai Loa, Kaluhi Okalani, Kalakaua Ehu, um, is a pioneer in this before it even became uh, popular. And my mentor is uh, Kekuni Blaisdell. Um, my name Kaui is after King uh, uh, Kaui Keuli Kamehameha III, um, who actually is a relative through Lili Okalani. And you can see that line. And we've been wanting to be able to restore through my mother and through uh, people like Kekuni. I can um, bring together, coordinate the, our, our um, sovereignty people who I've worked with as well as our non-active people. And it, that's very important so we can have our self-identity, as, as Sister mentioned, and that we can become a great Hawaiian people as we have been in the past. Mahalo. Thank you. A second question concerning governance is, do you support a Hawaii constitutional convention? Why or why not? You have 60 seconds to answer this question. I'm sorry, First will I'm be sorry, 90 seconds for this um, one. It's going to be 90. Yeah. 90 seconds. Candidate Brooke, you're first, followed by candidate Akaka, candidate Amsterdam, and then can candidate Paikai. Well, I don't support the Constitutional Convention at this time. OHA, I believe, was fine. It's just that the rules that governed it um, did not provide the kind of leadership that we needed. Way back then, in the beginning, um, 50 candidates ran, and everybody voted. Now we finally have a primary. You know, now we have some selection. Uh, a convention, I'm afraid, might disrupt some of the things that we have. We may not have OHA anymore. The only thing that didn't come out of the CONCON -con back then was that OHA was supposed to be a freestanding entity and not under the legislature or under the state. And that was not... Um, allowed and for obvious reasons you know that would be too much control over our own resources our own destiny so I don't think a constitutional convention at this time is in the best interest of us I think that we need to do our own self-organization I think that uh, more guidelines with OHA I think changing the election process or even OHA um, paying for their own election now I do believe that we are nationals and that we're not blood Hawaiians, that we are national Hawaiians, that we belong to a nation. And I would just like to see more of that conversation proceed. So, no, I am, I'm not in support of the, a constitutional convention at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Akaka. I'd be interested to learning more about the pros and cons of the state constitutional convention and learn about how it would benefit our Native Hawaiians and the people of Hawaii. Thank you. Candidate Amsterdam. Mahalo. Uh, at the last, uh, we've had uh, a constitutional convention uh, in 1965, uh, 68, and then 78, and also uh, uh, in the 50s. Uh, and the one that was in 78, we have already determined that is discuss the issues of common concern, facilitate the process of self-determination and leading to self-governance. So we already know what we're supposed to do. If the, con uh, the Constitutional Convention will help us to fulfill what we've already established uh, in the 78, then that'll be fine. But I don't think we should depend on a Constitutional Convention any more than we should uh, depend upon our landlords being the, st uh, uh, the state in order to get rent, uh, rents. We should be the landlord to get the rents from them. You're in a better position if you're, if you're the landlord, right, rather than being the, the tenant. Um, so therefore, we already know that it's a matter of uh, advancing our self-governance, our self-entity. Um, and um, as I mentioned, 
Uh, my associates, uh, uh, Israeli Jews, are ex experts in self-governance, in, in, in nation building, uh, in, in agriculture, which we can use for fish ponds and papaya and taro. And so we can get the experts. And it's consistent with what our, our, our um, ali'i did. Uh, Kalakawa sought the model for Britain here in Hawaii. And so we can ask for assistance from our Israeli Jews also so that we can fulfill the, the, the mandate that we already received uh, to do in the last uh, uh, Constitutional Convention. Bezrat Hashem in Hebrew, with the help of uh, Keakua, may we do so. Mahalo. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> We've had some questions here that are more um, not about policy. This is more about you. So, um, I didn't get a chance. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, mahalo for the question. <clears throat> so, in regards to the state constitution, I would have to decline at this time and say and say no uh, that I don't agree with the state constitution. Uh, one is the cost of you know practic the practicality of of having one. Also, we need to think about as as was already mentioned some of the things that we would probably be fighting against. Now, we also have to remember that we're not the only ones who vote, and especially in the Hawaiian community, um, uh, we don't vote, and it, it has to change. And so if it does happen, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared and ready to take action to make sure that the things that are already in place for our Hawaiian people continue to be in place and to continue and continue to be proactive about about that so we need to make sure that we have delegates ready to fight on behalf of our, our Hawaiian people especially to make sure that these things that we have benefited from almost 40 years now don't go away and that that is a that is a grave concern of mine so again no but also be ready because we we are not the only ones voting on this issue and if it does happen we need to be ready and prepared to take action Mahalo. thank you um as mentioned before, thank you for your comments. I'm sorry, I forgot you there. Um, and this is more about you as opposed to policy. Um, what is your favorite uh, Hawaiian activity? And I guess we can start from this side of the table over here. Favorite Hawaiian activity? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is it a one-word answer? Or you can <laughs> take your time. If you want to take the 90 seconds ago. I, I, would say, I would say hula, but actually it's it's... It's being at the beach. It's surfing. It's being out in the water. My my connection to the water is the most important thing for me. It's the place where I go to rejuvenate. It's the place where I go to cleanse. And you know, after a long day, when you're when you're doing things like this, you you need a place, uh, a sanctuary, and that is my sanctuary. So I would have to say being in the water. Uh, my favorite Hawaiian thing to do is to sing Hawaiian songs. Um, I'm an accomplished musician. Um, actually, I'm the organist at the Elks Lodge, but I'm um, a classical guitarist by training. But I just love singing Hawaiian songs <laughs> and um, singing with my friends and my brothers. That's even more fun. And teaching my granddaughter, you know, the Hawaiian songs. Um, sometimes I'll tell her little stories about it. Um, not too often because she's not that interested, but but uh, we listen to uh, Hawaiian music all the time, and we listen to our Atea Helm because she's uh, our family. And um, when my daughter was young, uh, they put her to sleep. Our Atea would do that because we're family. So that's my favorite Hawaiian activity. Undoubtedly, my favorite activity is going to a luau. <laughs> I want to go back to my little grass shack in <laughs> That's beautiful. I love the luau, and I love poi. Oh, my favorite Hawaiian activity, I would say, is a good talk story session that comes with Hawaiian music and dance, um, and especially with music from the yesteryears, um, Alfred Apaka, Uncle Mahi Beamer. Um, but that's something that my father does at Manalani, uh, Daniel Kaka Jr. He, every month he has a, the Twilight at Kalahui Pua'a where it's free to the community, to the guests, and it's an opportunity for people to come together, bala'au, talk story, share about their personal experience, experiences, and just share song and dance. Okay. Um, right, uh, so I have another question to ask, actually, um, and this one's a little bit different, not about policy, but still about you. Um, 
what are the qualities that a leader has? And I'm going to start from the side over here. Qualities that a leader has. Uh, first would be vision. And well, without, the, without a vision, um, the, the, the word says that people perish. Um, secondly, it's the, it's the heart. Of the, it's having the heart of the people at the, at the center. And this is, this is my own personal belief. But if you, if you don't have the heart of your people, then it really is hard to lead. It's hard to lead if you cannot go and sit down and talk and talk story with your people to understand where it is that they're coming from and those kinds of perspectives. Uh, and then lastly, it's the relatability. Just being able to go out and have a conversation in the community, talk about yourself and um, be, be accountable and be transparent. Those, those types of things, I, I believe, that are the things that a, a true leader should carry. Mahalo. For me, it's being very spiritually grounded, not religiously, but grounded spiritually. If it's, you know, like I feel grounded to the aina or to the ocean, to the kai, or to the kamakani, to the wind, or to my amakuas, uh, grounded to my kupunas, you know, to my ancestors. You know, I listen to them all the time. I feel they, they talk to me or they, the ideas that float in my mind come from them. So a leader is sort of chosen among the mix of being grounded spiritually, being able to have the gift to exchange ideas, to be able to kuka kuka, to be able to listen. So a good leader has to listen. And, and then in, in that, be able to fulfill some of the needs that their, you know, that, that their, their followers need. You know, and to find ideas, creativity. Uh, I'm a great visionary. I'm, you know, seeing things too far in the future. Um, and also a great sense of humor. You know, a great sense of humor is just absolutely necessary because you got to laugh at yourself when you do something wrong and can't be offended. You have to have a very strong ego to keep that ego in place so that you can move forward, you know, with everybody, not your ego, but with everybody. Um, and I think that even though I, I've done many things like that, I can experience that. And I think that the connectiveness is what we need more of in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Not just um, an employment history uh, or a degree. It's nice to have, but it's a spiritual groundness that keeps us all steady and focused. Thank you. Aloha. I think that a leader must have a aloha. Just like the Mashiach. Mashiach. It's, it's um, epitomized in that beautiful song. Love is a many splendor thing. It's aloha. I'd have to mirror a lot of what our candidates here have said. I think a good leader, um, a good leader has character, integrity, vision, wisdom, and that value of aloha to keep that running through them. In talking to my grandpa Kaka on, on this kind of work, he had told me that, you know, Kale, it's important to remember why you're doing this, and that's to help the people, help, help the people of Hawaii and help the Hawaiians because, again, when the Hawaiians rise up, everybody benefits. Um, well, right now we have our closing remarks. Um, each of you will be given 90 seconds. So we'll start um, with uh, Candidate Burke. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to share my whole message of unity. I'm an artist, and this is Ku, and this is Lono, and this is the Pico of Change and the Hooks in Life. The whole part of this unity piece is for 100,000 of us and future generations that when Ku leaves and Lono arrives, we, unified together in unity, will hold this painting or this object or whatever it represents for generations to come. And that is part of the spiritual grounding that I talk about. You know, some of the things that I'm not the creator, but more the steward of these ideas. We have to remember that our Ali'is were brilliant and leaving their wealth. They love their people so much. They love the future for their people. And so they put all their wealth, 
Nobody else on the planet has done that. And that's what I believe in. And I want to thank Princess Ruth and Powahi for giving me the education and the grounding that I needed. Because without Princess Ruth, there would be no Kamehameha schools. I also would like to have the opportunity to share my visions, my sovereignty buses of education, my gathering together of all of us and unity to Huli, the Lono and the Ku, these all contribute to the cultural grounding of what makes the Hawaiian nation and the Hawaiian citizens a great people. My great-grandfather, William Jarrett, worked for five monarchies and swore his allegiance to the kingdom. And I continue in his footsteps. Mahalo. Candidate Paikai. Mahalo again for this opportunity to share our thoughts and our manao with you. <clears throat> um, again, my name is Landon Paikai, and I'm a candidate for the Office of Wine Affairs Trustee at Large. Wanting to bring back integrity to the Office of Wine Affairs, specifically by connecting our resources, or connecting our people back to the resources they desperately need and deserve, by providing accountable, collaborative, transparent, and innovative opportunities now. Now more than ever, our people need the resources that are available. And there are many resources out there that are available. So we need to continue to hold them and make sure that our people are connected to those resources, whether it be through meetings outside in the, in the general public, whether it be coming to meetings, whether it be on the website or uh, a conglomerate of all the different resources that are available. We just need to make sure that our, our beneficiaries know what is out there, know what is available for them and providing practical solutions, practical solutions like financial literacy, like financial, being financially prepared to purchase a home, knowing what it is to purchase a home. If you want to go into business or you want to go into education, having those opportunities to take advantage of the educational opportunities that are out there, having the opportunities to take advantage of the educational benefits now that will continue to drive you and move you forward. And then, again, making sure that we each hold each ourselves accountable. So. Again, I want you guys to make sure that you go out and vote, but vote informed. Watch all the, all the candidates and then make, make your decision. And that, that is your power. Again, vote Akamai, vote Paikai. Mahalo. Candidate Asterdam. Mahalo for the, for the caucus and Olelo, for um, coordinator, um, uh, also um, Marilyn uh, Khan for putting this together, and to Keakua who's helping us in order to uh, achieve our destiny. Um, one of my main reasons for running for um, in la at large is because of the uh, need, uh, because of our foster children uh, on the Big Island and the families, our families that are, have been weakened. And it's my desire to be able to help them so that our children, our foster children uh, throughout Hawaii Ne, and also particularly in the Big Island can be helped. Um, as you know, uh, to be able to have our, um, our governing entity, whether it be the kingdom, as an alternative, um, and to be able to use my education, background, and experience to do it. Um, I'll, be, I'll do this. I'm committed to doing it. And now is the time so we don't continue to lose our resources, that we're able to regain our positive self-image, to build up these social determinants that I talked uh, about, and to be a great Native Hawaiian people uh, here in Hawaii, Nei, America, and throughout the world and to bring other resources, for, for instance, our, my, our fellow uh, Israeli Jews to help us because they're experts in agriculture and economics and in nation and, uh, in, in governing. With the help of Keakua, I ask your vote, Kawi Yohanan Amsterdam, Amsterdam's the man, and please spread the word. Maloha to our candidates also. Wonderful experience. Thanks again, Mala, uh, um, Mahalo, uh, and also to Keakua may help us in this wonderful important um, journey that we're on. Mahalo and aloha. Mahalo to everyone. Um, when I look around at this forum, this room, to me this is, this is synergy, this is partnerships, this is unity, this is community, this is a coming, coming together of minds to make our voices heard, to find good solutions. To me it's very important for for everyone to have good options, good opportunities. With Hawaii in my heart, I believe there needs to be the there needs to be balance, there needs to be resourcefulness, 
And my priorities are the well-being of the people, where there is a strategic plan that it can focus on home ownership, health care, education for our children, sustainability, economic opportunities, and those fundamental things that every family and every, every individual needs to succeed, where we don't just live, but we thrive. And I'll need your help to getting there, to do the work, and work towards these goals. So no matter what island you're on, please remember to shaka and vote akaka. Mahalo. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say mahalo uh, loa to all of you guys for your candid responses. Um, it's not easy going up here and getting in front of the cameras and doing this. So I want to thank you first off. Um, and also we want to uh, mention to the, to the viewers as well that this is your chance, this is your opportunity. Please take advantage of this. Please look at Ola Atlo. Thank you for watching. And also stay tuned for the uh, next uh, section, which are other OHA candidates as well. Aloha. We are back. Uh, welcome back to the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus of the Democratic Party's OHA Candidate Forum. Um, so, guys, what we've seen so far is two sessions of four candidates. And just wanted to recap what, who we've heard from thus far. Uh, for the Oahu seat, we heard from Jackie Koho'okele Burke and Kale Akaka. And then for the at large seat, we've heard from Makana Paris. Pohai Ryan, Kili Makekau, and for the Maui seat, current trustee Carmen Hulu Lindsay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, let's go back to this election process, because, um, you know, I want to introduce Jacob Aki, Aloha. who is a, uh, he works at the state legislature. So between you folks, we have a little, some knowledge about how the election process works. And like I mentioned in the last break, or in the, as we discussed, um, it's it's a little complicated. Yeah, the OHA elections are are not real user friendly, if you will. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to give a little bit of history about the process. Uh, you know, when when it was up until 2013, 2014, there were uh, no primary elections in OHA, so all the candidates went directly to the general, yeah. and they didn't have uh, voters didn't have an opportunity to vote in August and narrow the pool down. So if that was the case this year, we have 15 candidates running for the at-large seat. You would have 15 candidates that you would have to choose from in the uh, general. Whereas now, we have a primary um, where the pool will get narrowed down. So people have, again, that choice of three in the at-large race, and you get to choose one candidate um, in both the Oahu and Maui seats, and those will get narrowed down. The number of candidates will get narrowed down. So you know, I bring that up for a couple reasons. Um, OHA often criticized, and criticism is good, um, but it, 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 it was never intended to be stagnant. It's my understanding from talking to some of the people, the framers, if you will, that were there in 1978, and the intent was for it to be evolving and to be a stepping stone, and, and, and we see from how some of these laws have changed how the, uh, how the agency and the organization and the election process has evolved. So that said, um, you have any ideas or things that you've heard of in recent history about that election process and how maybe we can change it to include more voters? Sure, you know, I think one of the biggest problems that we've seen in past OHA races is that a large number of voters who vote don't vote for OHA candidates. Um, so for, from the candidate's perspective, that, that makes it quite difficult because, um, as we all know, running for OHA is a statewide election. So you're running the same race as if you're running for governor, for lieutenant governor, but without all of the funds. So, you know, and OHA's at the bottom of the ballot. You know, so I think um, to get more turnout and to have more people engaged with the OHA election process, you know, I really think there needs to be a public awareness campaign to educate people how to vote for OHA and why they should vote for OHA because you know I think if you were to walk down the street a lot of people wouldn't know about the Rice v 
Cayetano case, which really changed the entire election process for OHA. You know, so I think having education on the process, mm -hmm. um, letting people know why they should care about Hawaiian issues, because whether you are Hawaiian or not, I think it's everyone's responsibility who lives in Hawaii to not only know about Hawaiian issues, but to care about Hawaiian issues as well. And voting in the OHA election is one of those things. You know, so I think having a public awareness campaign and educating everybody about OHA, its missions, and why they should get involved is really needed right now. You know, that's a great, you know, great talking points and great mana'o, Jacob. Um, you know, uh, Rebecca, I wanted to ask you, in recent years at the legislature, we've actually seen some bills introduced that would have kind of shaped and changed how uh, OHA elections take place. Um, for example, in 2016, mm -hmm. I believe there was a bill introduced that would randomize the placement of names yes. on the ballot. Yes. So Name right now, so as it stands now, it's alphabetical order. So Shucks, those, I wouldn't be at the top of the ballot. A, name, <laughs> name randomization. <laughs> so if, starting with the letter A, obviously, on down, that's how the, uh, elects, the, the ballots, the names on the ballots are listed. So this bill would have randomized that. Um, and then la just this year, and, and last year, I believe, there was a bill that would have uh, or attempted to break up the three-way race into individual races. So that's probably the most complicated mm -hmm. element of the Ohio election is this at-large seat where you have three seats open under one ballot item. So I believe the intent of the bill was to break it up into individual races. Um, neither of those bills passed. But, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, why those types of uh, uh, you know, measures and, and attempts to change uh, the election structure yeah. are, are important. Well, I mean, we know just from sort of the history of voting period mm -hmm. that different processes empower certain people over mm -hmm. others. And sometimes you're empowering people um, that have greater access to to money and resources and means to be able to mm -hmm. get on air. You know, Jacob talked about the access to have money to get on airways and to try to rise above the rest of your field. Um, but also, something as simple and completely benign as like what letter your last name starts with. I mean, so look for example, you know, you talked about the 2016 attempt to randomize last names, um, which is you know, unfortunately, in my opinion, at least, didn't didn't pass, and mm -hmm. and that would have changed it not just for OHA but for mm -hmm. all races. Mm -hmm. um, and what it would have done was it would have taken basically just you know, take a little Scrabble bag and pull out a different letter, it still would go in alpha order, but maybe it would start with J or with M or mm -hmm. with S or oh, something I like see, that. So you'd still have this randomization, but I mean, you look at Office of Hawaiian Affairs specifically, and you know, we have one, some wonderful trustees, but interestingly, if you just look at last names, five of nine, wow. five of nine, but I mean, how many Hawaiians do we know with like K last names? Right, and, right, right, right. So it's just, it's just interesting. It's not a judgment call. It's just a, you know, there seems to be some influence um, that lower, you know, on the ballot races basically are based more off of name recognition and off of just kind of like order of how something appears on the ballot. And that, I think, really comes back to what Jacob was talking about, about just lack of education, mm -hmm. lack of education about the race, mm -hmm. education about the people who are running, um, mm -hmm. lack of interest, lack of real, you know, feeling like it's user friendly. So mm -hmm. things like randomization, I think the work that was done on creating the primary was super critical um, because before that you had people run, really winning general elections with the plurality of the vote. So right. they weren't even getting the majority of the voters. Right. They were getting perhaps a very small fraction of the vote. Mm -hmm. And so it not only provides people an opportunity to learn more about the candidates, both in the primary and in the general, but it also makes sure that it's really a majority vote right. type of situation. So right. yeah, I think that all of those types of efforts to keep making it a more and more egalitarian democratic process that everyone has access to, no matter whether you have 20 hours in the week to dedicate to you know political engagement or whether you have you know zero time just the 20 seconds while someone's sign waving on the side of the road right right, right. kind of forces you to do some homework at least a I, little yeah, bit yeah. right or at least talk to your family or friends and ask for advice yeah, yeah i mean i certainly would hope that people would be doing more than just voting purely mm -hmm. off of name recognition right, and off right. of order. Of, right, right. Uh, you know, and some of our A, you know, last name candidates are phenomenal candidates. You would be an amazing trustee, what, for what the record. Would, what would your slogan <laughs> be, Jacob? You know, in the last segment, we saw a lot of great uh, slogans, and I don't know. I don't know what mine would be, so. 
What would yours be? <laughs> Price is right. What else? Becky, you got you got one? Uh, it's probably something like, you know, go vote for me real soon. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, actually, I want to get back to something you mentioned, which is uh, how, how people can, it's, this is actually a good good topic, how, how can people get educated? So for the people that don't have time yeah. Yeah. to even look up a website and, and to read through the website, which is, you know, that's arduous, that's, that's, that, that's time consuming and, and takes a lot of, uh, I don't know, quite a bit of effort, yeah, and, and at least some understanding. What, what are some simple ways that you think our people can, or people in general can uh, learn about the candidates or who they might be inclined to voting for? You know, I think, you know, in this election cycle thus far, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, commercials from the Office of Elections encouraging people mm -hmm. to vote. You know, and I'm not sure if this would um, be something that OHA would be interested in, but, you know, I think it'd be a great idea if OHA, you know, partnered with the Office of elections or other community partners, you know, to create a um, commercial or a radio ad, uh, not supporting any particular candidate, but just encouraging people to vote um, and letting them know why it's important to vote for OHA. And for me, that's the biggest thing is it is important because for us Kanaka out there who are beneficiaries of, um, the, of the office, you know, OHA provides great opportunities and if we have the opportunity to get more leaders elected to that boardroom you know we might see the change that we want to mm -hmm. see you know so I think there should be some sort of investment um, some sort of public awareness uh, pieces on what is OHA why is it important and why you should all vote um, because you know this issue of OHA isn't something new um, and, you know, when we look back through uh, a lot of our um, issues that we've had to face, you know, we find that it comes down to public education. You know, this was the same question that, you know, those in the Hawaiian language movement were asking themselves 40 years ago is how do we get people to care about Hawaiian language? How do we get people to engage in the language of our kupuna? So if we take that mindset and a apply it um, in this very important issue, you know, we might see that change that we really want to see, so. Right, short answer. Simple way to learn about who you may be well, inclined to vote. if you're for. watching this right now, great start, <laughs> for sure. I mean, talk to people that, who you trust, talk to people who you do know are involved and mm -hmm. who are paying attention, um, get their mano'o, you know, and it's not to say, okay, tell me who to vote for, mm -hmm. but you know, talk to me a little bit in about why I should care about this person or why this person is better suited to really fill the role of the mission of OHA to, mm -hmm. to serve Hawaiians. Awesome, awesome answers. Always talk to friends and family. That's, yeah, that's, that's I mean, that's how that's we do, like, right? People, right, right. And, and I know a lot of people like to avoid talking about politics, but yeah. there's always ways to slip it in there. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> and um, this is life. I mean, I think that our our community is. Ha I mean, we are a very civically engaged community, right, right. Um, and I think that there's lots of opportunities. And we're talking about everything from culture, Aina, education, housing. These are all super pertinent issues that Office of Hawaiian Affairs impacts in large and in small ways. And these and who our trustees are plays a big role in whether or not staff, whether or not the organization, um, the credibility of the organization can continue right. to do the work it needs to do. I, I, I agree 100%. Um, leadership starts with those who are leading our, our organizations Absolutely. and Absolutely. who are on the ground, whether it be political organizations or whether it be community-based organizations or schools or, you know, different social clubs or families and households. Mm -hmm. Leadership is critical and it, the example that these trustees set really does set a tone. Mm -hmm. Whether we believe, like to believe it or recognize that or not, there is a tone set. So these are very important decisions. So please reach out to your family and friends and just talk story and no need get nuts. You know, and just, just <laughs> aloha everybody and just share some manao. Yeah. So before we get back into some of the more pressing, you know, serious issues, you brought up something during the break. Yeah. And I know you wanted to shout out some of the local designers oh, yes. that we've seen. We're gonna have our Merry Monarch <laughs> moment here. Yes. Gang. Everyone. Shout out to Amy Kalili, Kiahi Tucker, you know. So, so who did Big you Big shoes we're trying to, you know, fill right now, <laughs> for <laughs> sure. Kuleana. <laughs> so, well, okay, so I mean, just on the issue of economic um, sovereignty, 
really critical, of course, to our community. We've talked a little bit about it tonight. And in fact, Office of Foreign Affairs does manage the Native Hawaiian Revolving Loan Fund and, in mm -hmm. fact, invest in a lot of Native Hawaiian small businesses. Um, but on that on that note, you know, we saw a lot of amazing Hawaiian designers featured we did. tonight. Some beautiful manuheli. I'm repping manuheli tonight. What are so you repping, beautiful. Becky? The original Noa Noa. The original. <laughs> nice, nice. And I have Rick's. Yeah. I'm not sure if Rick's is Hawaiian, but it's the local, local hey, brand. It's local super brand. local. Yeah, nice. We saw, though, tonight, uh, I think Auntie Lemomi was repping some Nakeu Hawaii. Yes. Beautiful. Shout out to Uncle. Is a yep. Trip. And I saw some Sig Zane, I think. Yes, that there were a couple of Sig Zane out there. Yeah, Kainoa yeah. had some Sig Zane. I saw Ari South, in fact. Oh, nice, nice. Featured as well. Um, those are the ones that I saw. I don't know. So, mahalo to all of our local designers out there. Mahalo to everyone who supports our local designers and please continue to do so because it's just fabulous. And thank you for the wonderful lole that yes, we have. Right? And, and if we do this again during the general, maybe we can get some stuff on loan. So shout mm. out to you guys. Hey, we can give just you a shout saying. out. Just saying. We'll take know. jewelry to yes, Tahiji <laughs> Pearl. Always going to return the house shows. Okay, we're getting ready to wrap up, gang. And we're going to keep going right now. <laughs> so uh, back to some of the important you know, issues that we have here uh, discussing this evening, um, I want to mention that uh, I did a little bit of homework before coming tonight, and w I looked at both party platforms, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. So the OHA race is nonpartisan, yes. meaning people do not run particular to any political it party. It could be no party, in fact. In and everyone can yeah. vote, regardless mm -hmm. of what party ballot you're voting on. Correct. Right? Um, but I did notice in both party platforms there was a section de uh, dedicated to Native Hawaiian issues, Native Hawaiian rights, both in the great. Republican Party and the Democratic Party. So I think that's excellent. You know, yeah, you know that's a great point that you bring up um, because you know when we look back into our history and why the Democratic and Republican parties were founded here in Hawaii, we look back at our history and and we find that it was founded by Hawaiians who really wanted to. Um, Make a difference in the lives of those in our Lahui, and that's not, and that's something that a lot of people in both parties don't know is that its foundation and in its establishment is from our own people. You want to mm -hmm. name some of those people? That you know, so the Democratic parties. Party was founded by Prince David Kavananakoa, um, Hawaii's second um, delegate to Congress, Prince Jonah Kuhio, was a member of the Republican Party. Um, you know, so when we look at those in our past who really had a difference in um, not just the politics but in the lives of our Lahui, they were very engaged in both mm -hmm. parties. You know, so I think it's important for both parties to honor their past and to recognize the unique history that Native Hawaiians play in um, Hawaii politics. And actually there was a third leader, uh, there was a third party at that time. The Home Rule. Home Rule party that was led by yeah. Robert Wilcox, who and was actually the first, first congressional delegate elected. Yes. And it, you know, another unique point that always kind of yeah. made me wonder, people often, made me think. You know, you is, know people often um, remember uh, Prince Jonah Kuhio as um, Hawaii's uh, delegate to Congress, but we have to remember that Willie Koki, Robert Wilcox, who led that rebellion in 1895, he was in fact our first delegate to Congress. All three of those individuals were also imprisoned for treason by yes, the provisional they were. government. They were rebels, and then they went on to lead parties and engage. You know, very important history for our people to know. Yeah. So um, we have a few minutes before the next uh, section, before the next round of candidates come up. And so just to recap some of the issues that we heard the candidates yeah. talk about and the, and, the, and the questions that were asked. So we heard a little bit about governance, self-determination, mm -hmm. the Constitutional Convention, which mm -hmm. is a hot-button topic yes. this year for sure. It's on the ballot. Um, housing and education. You want to take a stab at, at, at just sharing some manao about why, any, why, why we hear those issues? Yeah, those well, I mean, obviously these issues. are the issues that voters and residents are thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we have seen across all races this year and in polls that housing and solutions for our homeless community are at the top of people's minds. Mm -hmm. And as we see the affordable housing gap really continue to grow and be projected to grow even further over the next decade, um, I think it's, it's important to know that OHA plays a big role in that. OHA Definitely. has had important advocacy in holding accountable other state and county agencies. Mm -hmm. um, OHA has played a role in investing significant amount of money in housing, um, has land holdings that we'll see what happens with some of those land holdings in the year to co years to come. But I think those are the issues that people are thinking about and caring about. In addition to just 
the resources that OHA can dedicate to helping them build housing and things like that. Advocacy. Yeah. You know, advocacy at the county level when you have issues like transient vacation rentals, mm -hmm. which are Airbnbs. Which huge are issues. Huge issues being tackled right now. Yeah. OHA has an advocacy team that is researching these topics and, and, and you know, that's another role the trustees yeah. play yeah. where we're going to prioritize yeah. these various issues yeah. and the things that we're going to focus on. So but, you know, one, and one quick point is that, you know, what OHA can provide is um, no matter what the issue is, OHA has the opportunity to bring a Hawaiian perspective mm -hmm. to all of these issues, which is something that I think we really need in government today. So, right points. Mahalo, you guys. Yes. We're going to get into our third round. And this next round will feature two Oahu candidates, Esther Kia Aina, Sam, Samuel Wilder King, um, and then three at-large candidates, William Ayla, Kale Aina Lee, and current trustee Leao Isa. So this one should be lively, gang. I'm Stay tuned. I'm hoping that would, this, is, this is the grand finale. Yes. You know, let's, let's, let's hope for some, some good, lively, spirited, <laughs> and good manao and great yes. ideas come all to the positive, table. Yeah? All positive, all positive. Stay Hold tuned. On. Aloha, and welcome to this evening's third session of the OHA Candidates Trustees Forum. My name is Lemomi Khan, and I am chair of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. For those just joining the forum, we'd like to briefly share with you information about the caucus. It is an entity of the Democratic Party of Hawaii and seeks to address issues of self-determination, protection of Hawaiian cultural practices, pono economic develop development, protection of Hawaii's natural environment in the ocean and um, on land, housing, health, and education. We do this through educational forums like this evening's OHA Candidate Forum and legislative advocacy. Recognizing that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs election is a nonpartisan race and all registered voters in the state of Hawaii can vote, we thought it would be good to put on this for forum this evening to educate voters on issues of importance to the Hawaiian community so that informed decisions on voting for the right candidate will happen. Earlier, we heard from candidates Hulu Lindsay. Makana Parish, Pohai Ryan, Kelly Imake Kau, Jackie Burke, Kale Akaka, Kawi Amsterdam, Landon Paikai. In this session, our guests are Trustee Le Ahuisa, Esther Kia Aina, and Samuel Wilder King II for the Oahu seat, William Aila, and Brandon Kale Aina Lee for the Oahu at large seats. Um, in our forum tonight, candidates will be given two minutes to provide opening remarks, followed by the opportunity to answer questions concerning fiscal management responsibility, governance, and delivery of programs and services to Native Hawaiians, and then providing some closing remarks. Our moderators for this session are Rayton Varez and Juanita Kawamoto-Brown. Timekeeper is Melody Aduha, mahalo Melody. All are members of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus, all who love and are committed to doing good for our people. And so, Rayten and Juanita, e holo mua. Mahalo nui and tili momi, uh, and aloha. Aloha, everyone. Uh, aloha to our viewing audience. Mahalo. Uh, welcome back uh, for joining. Welcome, welcome back uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we sh we, let's begin with opening remarks, uh, as Antimomi said, with... Uh, Two minutes each for each candidate. Uh, may we start with uh, Ms. Kia Aina, uh, to be followed by Mr. King, uh, who are both running for the Oahu seat, uh, to be followed by Trustee Ahu Isa, uh, Mr. Aila, and, and finally, Mr. Kale Aina Lee, who are running for OHA at large. Uh, Ms. Kia Aina, please. Aloha mai kako. My name is Esther Kia Aina from Nanakuli, Oahu, and I am running for the Oahu seat for the Board of Trustees because I believe and support the restoration of civility in the OHA boardroom, improved transparency and fiscal accountability, and term limits for the OHA trustees. 
I believe that my 25 years of effective public policy experience in Washington, D.C., Hawaii, and the Pacific Islands would be an asset to the Board of Trustees. Most notably, I worked for Senator Kaka in the 1990s during a critical period for our community. And we were able to get the U.S. government to acknowledge the uh, complicity, its complicity in the 1893 overthrow and commit itself to a process of reconciliation, which is continuing today. I also served uh, Senator, um, President Obama at the Interior Department, where I managed a $600 million budget and oversaw overall federal policy for the U.S. territories in the Pacific and Caribbean and financial assistance for the freely associated states of Micronesia. I look forward uh, to our discussion today on important issues to our Hawaiian community. Mahalo, Ms. Kia Aina. Uh, Mr. King, please. Aloha. Thank you to all the candidates for being here, the moderators, the caucus. I am Samuel Wilder King II. I am running for the Oahu at-large seat. You can read much more than this two minutes can provide you at my website, votesamking.com. I am the descendant of Kalani Ho'oulumoku Ikekai, a chief of Oahu who was defeated by Kamehameha and pushed off of the Pali, and his daughter Mahi, who was given to Oliver Holmes by Kamehameha after he joined Kamehameha and the conquest. My grandfather was Samuel Palethorpe King, the federal judge and the author of Broken Trust. My great-grandfather was Samuel Wilder King, the governor of Hawaii. Their legacy informs my decision making and what I believe is the right thing to do for the Hawaiian people. I am a life, I'm born and raised in Hawaii. I'm a graduate of Punahou School, Georgetown University, and the William S. Richardson School of Law. I've clerked at the Hawaii State Supreme Court. I've worked as a real estate attorney for three years, and I now work in the healthcare industry as in house counsel. I, I've re I work specifically on contract law, and I've also been the mem a member and president for the past three years of my homeowners association, which sounds underwhelming, but you learn one important thing as a member of your homeowners association, and that's about fiduciary duties. And that's what I want to bring back to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. The recent audit revealed that fiduciary duties are misunderstood by many of the trustees at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Training is required for that. I want to bring an understanding of those responsibilities to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I want to bring evidence-based policy making to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I want to bring a fresh perspective from the next generation to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I am the candidate for change, and I believe that I have the set of skills that can bring that change about. Please vote for me for the Oahu seat. Mahalo. Mahalo, Mr. King. Uh, Trustee Ahuisa, your two minutes. Hello, my kako. The two minutes. People should know who I am. I've been in politics 25 years. State rep. Well, first ran city council law. State representative eight years. Board of education eight years. Till got kicked out. Now it's appointed, and then now OHA. I'm just going to run another term. That's eight years. You know, I don't want to be no career politician in here. And I I spoke for the bill that Senator Miley Shimabukuro had about you know kind of even re well. Well, it's a, it's a bill that I think we should look at closely in the next legislative session. I'm running again because I got in three years ago. I want to kind of finish. It took a while to figure out OHA, very different board from being in the state representative. You know, it's the floor of the house, decorum, you got Robert's rules, you follow. Board of Ed, same thing. I was a vice president, went to 30 graduations, visited 285 public schools. I get into OHA, and it's just different. <laughs> We need a sergeant of arms. But, but it's, you know what, because of Sunshine Law, we shouldn't, as a fiduciary trustee of a trust fund, be subject to a Sunshine Law where we're not, a, I asked, the first thing I asked Justice Klein, are we a state agency or are we are private? You know, I can't figure out this, sometimes quasi-state agency, sometimes not, and then we get hit with this audit. They warned me not to talk about it. FBI is investigating us, so I don't want to say anything on there. Get asked a question by the grand jury and then commit a felony. So I'm going to stay away from that. So I give all my friends here the chance to take my time. But that's why I'm running again. Give me another term. I was very idealistic, just like uh, Sam King here when I first got in. But you learn. 
you learn the politics of who has the power. When you first get in an organization, you don't just go in and ramrod your way through it. You have to figure out who does what, plan, strategize. Okay, that's all. Bala Awadis. Mahalo, great then. Mahalo, trustee. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Mr. Kako. I'm Muli Maila, Jr. Um, born and raised uh, on the western side of the island of Oahu in a place called Waianae. Uh, very uh, dry, very um, very rugged place. Uh, so you grow up, uh, you grow up knowing the rules really, really early in your life. Uh, you learn how to deal with people, and you learn how to deal with situations. Um, Graduate of uh, Waianae High School, proud sea writer, and then went on to the University of Hawaii where uh, I had my bachelor's degree in um, agriculture, of all things. And then um, went to work in private industry uh, for the plantation, believe it or not, when the plantation was still around on Oahu, pineapple plantation in Dole. Um, had a number of seri a, a series of jobs and then uh, really found that the job that I think uh, fit me for quite a while. So I've managed a boat harbor on the, on the Waianae coast for almost 24 years. Um, did everything from fixing water pipes 12 o'clock at night uh, with my wife handing me the glue um, to uh, enforcing administrative rules to getting to know how to deal with, uh, with people at a, at a very um, basic level. I uh, was fortunate enough by, to be asked by the governor um, then, Neil Abercrombie, to um, take the helm at the Department of Land and Natural Resources where I don't think anybody thought that um, I would last a week. Uh, that was that was what was told to me by many, many people that you know, people in power thought, eh, one week he's you know he's not going to do this. Um, found a group of people there that were very dedicated to uh, to the state of Hawaii and dedicated to the people and the environment in Hawaii. Then um, am finishing up as a deputy director at the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, and so the administrative experience, the um, ability to work with people and bring people together to solve complex problems. Um, I do have that experience and offer that to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the people who um, are voting in this election. Thank you. Excellent. Mahalo. Mr. Lee, please, your two minutes. Uh, aloha my kako. My name is Brendan Kaleaina Lee and I'm running for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs at large seat because I have a vision for a better Oha and a better Hawaii for all. Uh, my grandmother, Mary Vahine Okalani Lee, is a former Kupuna founding member of the Protect Oha Lavi Ohana. Both my parents are former presidents of the Association of Hawaiian Civic Club, and as such, they all raised me from a very young age to be civically engaged. I am the current second vice president for the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs. I am also the president of the Kamehameha Schools Alumni Association. Um, in 2016, some 125 Native Hawaiians came together at Mauna Wili and they deliberated and debated and ultimately wrote and passed the Native Hawaiian Constitution. As the elected chair of that body, I have a proven track record of bringing opposing sides together to the table to find common ground to help move Native Hawaiians forward. And that's something that's been missing for a very long time in the boardroom at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And I think as my training as a parliamentarian, that's something that I bring to the table that will help bring civility back to the boardroom. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo, mm -hmm. candidate, trustee, and mahalo, Rayton. Um, regarding OHA fiscal management responsibilities, we have two questions for you by way of background. The Hawaii State Constitution, Article 12, Section 6, provides that the OHA board shall exercise power as provided by law to manage and administer the proceeds from the sale or other disposition of the lands, natural resources, minerals, and income derived from whatever sources for Native Hawaiians and Hawaiians, including all income and proceeds from that pro rata portion of the public trust referred to in Section 4 of Article 12 for Native Hawaiians. Question is, this year, the State Attorney General issued two reports of their audit of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Both reports found the need for improvement in the management and administration of the OHA funds 
Specifically, the Ag AG found problems with the approval and accountability process for spending OHA income. If elected as an OHA trustee, how will you assure that income is properly spent and that the OHA administrator, staff, and the trustees themselves are held accountable? You have one minute to answer this question. Candidate King, you are first. I think that there has to be accountability at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and I've said that to have that accountability, we must replace the CEO that is currently in place. I'm sure CEO Crab has worked very hard and he's put his blood, sweat, and tears into the Office of Wine Affairs, but in the end, you have to have accountability at the top. So that is the first and foremost after these audits that must happen. There must be that shift. Second, you would implement the recommendations of the audit. I think that you can immediately remove the Kulia initiatives and the other discretionary grants, the CEO sponsorships, not necessarily for all time, because there's certainly a role for the CEO to have a discretion, because the trustees, I think there's a risk of micromanagement. So, but at this time, I think the community wants to rebuild that trust, and that's what I would do. And finally, I would want to bring evidence-based policy back to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs has data that does not have the accuracy level they require, and I've written about it in Civil Beat. I think they need to start running their own polls of the Native Hawaiian people and then use that data to more effectively allocate the resources. Mahalo. Mahalo. Candidate Ayla. Sure. Um, I think before we um, you know, ask anybody to, um, to be replaced, uh, whether it be the CEO or the um, trustees, uh, there has to be a basis. I mean, there's, there's this thing called due process um, under law. And, Believe it or not, even under kingdom law, there was due process. Um, the OHA um, audit, I think, by the state auditor, because OHA is a quasi-state agency, I don't believe that the uh, auditor completely understood um, all of the aspects of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I'll give one example. The $3, three million dollar, um, agreement between OHA and the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to fund bonds that were issued to create infrastructure to build homes for Native Hawaiians is not a discretionary grant. It's a direct negotiation between two state agencies. So it showed that the state auditor really didn't understand the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Thank you. Candidate Ayla. Kale Aina, please, please. Um, contrary to what a lot of people believe, those policies and procedures are in place currently. Um, it's true what the audit said. Well, it also should be stated because um, we haven't said it yet this evening. Um, we all, most of us at some point have stated this, that state audits are a good thing. They're a report card. They tell you how you're doing, how you can improve. Um, as Mr. Ayala stated, the state auditor didn't necessarily understand the way OHA runs and all the aspects of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So the policies are in place they just need to be enforced. That enforcement is supposed to come from the boardroom. It's difficult for people in the boardroom to be focusing on policy when they're busy filing lawsuits against each other. So it's not that we need to create new policies like the question suggests. The policies are there, the procedures are there in place. We just need a board that's gonna focus on the work and make sure that they're implemented and followed. Mahalo. Mahalo Nui. Candidate Kia Aina. First, uh, I would uh, take seriously uh, all of the recommendations of the state auditor to help in the restoration of trust within our community and the public. And since there are a lot of recommendations, uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, in concert with the ongoing state and federal investigations, as well as an ethics investigation, uh, I think the trustees, uh, current trustees, are in the best position to be determining uh, staff accountability. Uh, second, I would assess the, um, the caliber of the OHA uh, Council as well as the Council uh, in general that provides uh, ethics to ensure that the proper training uh, is done of all of the trustees as well as the staff. And uh, lastly, I would hold myself accountable 
for the highest ethical standards. Mahalo nui, Esther. And finally, candidate Le Ahuisa, trustee. I wanted to answer that question. I cannot answer in 60 seconds. <laughs> we will try to do, do, do your best. Auditor <laughs> Les Kondo, he doesn't understand. He was placed in that position to get him, I'm sorry, if I'm tele this is being televised. You know, I came from the House of Representatives, so I have a lot of friends still there. I go there and I lobby for OHA over there. He was head of the Ethics Commission. He was head of OIP. Now they put him in the audit position. So he came after us. He got some of that stuff wrong. He accused me of sending somebody to some rodeo in Las Vegas. It wasn't my money. It was our standards. They got the funds all mixed up. I got in in January. I was sworn in in January. I got elected November 4th. 2014 was right the day before TCM's birthday. I remember that because he passed away and his birthday was November 5th. And I thought, my God, TC, I won. <laughs> I won this election. And then when I got into OI, I said, what is this 8,000? Oh, it's the balance from trustee standards. Oh, but when I got into the House of Rep, I got 10,000 on my own. It's a contingency fund you use to newsletters to communicate with your constituents. So I said, okay, I took the money. And then when they did the audit, they took all his expenses, put it together. When it, so that audit is not right. You talk about fake news. They didn't get me on this. Can I talk about no other things that the FBI is investigating? He doesn't understand about this money. Like you said, the $3 million going to DHHL, we can leverage that money. We have a meeting. I brought the agenda for our next meeting, and Trustee Hulu is here. She's chair of this committee. And we're going to talk about restructuring the LLCs, and we're going to talk about Spire, this company that we got as a consultant who mapped out how we can even issue state bonds. Or oh, doesn't know all this stuff. My bachelor is in, is in accounting, so I understand. And being a state representative, I know how we can leverage that. You want me to answer about the affordable housing? Because we're going to look at that too. You know, like there's so many ideas that are going on in OHA. I think since I got on till now, our board has improved. It's changed. You could talk to Kuching. I mean, we was up on that Mauna. Uh, Trustee Hulu and I, when we first got in, we were protesting uh, about the TMT. And I really got into, I'm passionate about this. The money I make at OHA, I really don't need. You know, I have, a real, I have a really good job. So I give it away. Today I gave it to Kupunas, who are learning computers with Carol Kai's charity. So when I look at Les Kondo's audit, I said, this is wrong. I even saw Anita from Civil Beat. When you come interview me, you better print what is right. Because otherwise, I'm, I'm going to have to say, and what you see is what you get with me. I think I'm one of the most ethical lawmakers in this state. And I've been in politics 25 years. That's all I have to share. I cannot say anything more because I know a lot more, but I won't say. Mahalo Nui. Mahalo Nui. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Trustee. I'm uh, moving on. Uh, Second question under this category, let me begin. The state's obligation to Kanaka Maoli is firmly established in our state constitution. How the state satisfies that constitutional obligation requires policy decisions that are primarily within the authority and expertise of the legislative branch. One of the policy decisions, policy decisions is the amount to be transferred to OHA from the Public Lands Trust. More than a decade has passed since the enactment of Act 178 from 2006 that set an annual interim figure of $15.1 million. Over the last few years, bills have been introduced to require that government officials study and make written recommendations on the proposed annual amount of interim income and proceeds from the, the public land trusts that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs shall receive annually. Uh, in spite of the efforts to get excuse me, all parties to the table, little progress uh, has been made to advance this issue. Uh, question, if elected as an OHA trustee, what strategy would you advocate to get the state to update the annual amount income and proceeds from the PLT due to OHA? You have one minute to answer. Uh, uh, let's start off with uh, uh, Mr. Ayla, please. Aloha. Well, <clears throat> the, the only strategy that is going to work is a legislative strategy because they hold the purse strings, right? So you need to figure out how to... Um, how to get uh, a body that is not in the um, normal mode of, of restoring justice to Native Hawaiians to restore justice to Native Hawaiians. The data is clear. I think the amount that 
OHA should be getting is somewhere in the $70 million per year range. But now OHA has to do its part and it has to demonstrate that it can spend that money in a way that effectively uh, enhances the, the lives of our beneficiaries. And so that, that is a two-pronged approach that needs to be done. Um, and in order to start that process, we have to, of course, talk to each other across the table at board meetings in a way that people believe that we're really working together. And so those are three strategies that uh, I think will be successful over time in getting the uh, correct amount of money that is due OHA and the beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Um, I'm going to agree that it's actually not an OHA strategy thing. It, it has to come from the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that OHA every year in their legislative package try and push that through the legislature to get the correct funds of what OHA is due for the 20% pro rata from the public land trust. Um, but as was stated, if trustees aren't showing responsibility, it's difficult to convince lawmakers to give the, to give the organization more funds. Um, the other important strategy that everyone out there can do is help advocate for more Native Hawaiians to run for office. If we have more Native Hawaiians holding those purse strings, then we're going to have somebody on the inside advocating for what's best for Native Hawaiians. And that will help go a long way to help push that forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Trustee Ahuisa. Please. Yes, you have one minute. The legislature, like Bill Isla, trustee, trustee, Bill Isla said, it is a legislature. 15 mil. Let's expect us to do it 15 mil when we got the need is so great out there. We asked for 35 mil this year. We asked for it last time. We tried when Honlani Apollyon was in there. She said 35 mil. They cut it down to 15 mil. They have 119 million sitting in BNF right now. They have it in storage in there because they said we cannot get the money. We're supposed to get 20 percent. Talk about Con Con State, the, the Constitution, 1978. 20% of ceded land revenue. The economy is booming now. Well, we're coming almost like the 10 year on the real estate. I'm also a broker, I gotta disclose. So we look at the land values and they give us Kaka'ako Makai. It's been sitting there for three years since I got in. How many times you tried to negotiate things? This is just frustrating. Their ideas, we just gotta implement. But first, we got to get more of that money if we want to help the charter schools. We want to get affordable housing. We want to get the homeless off the streets. A lot of them are Hawaiians. I walk over Chinatown. I give them. I carry a lot of fives with me. I'm not bragging. I'm just sharing what I do with my money. I, can't, I cannot walk past somebody who is hungry sitting there. I know they're Hawaiian. I'm not going to ask, are you Hawaiian? So I'm going to give you money. This is what, I'm not going to say the governor. This is what the past governors and now holding. Then they passed Act 195, mandating OHA fund any kind of event we have like Nile Puni. We have to fund it. Why, why are they holding 119 mil? So every year we go beg for it when it's our land. Ceded land is our public land trust. We're supposed to get 20% of the revenue. Airport didn't give us. Outrigger, Waikiki Yacht Club, all sit on ceded lands. Okay, and then they say, oh, look at the Hawaiian people. You know, how come they're homeless? Yeah, give us the money. I understand about, yeah, we got to get the plan, like, you know, Mr. Lee here says. We got plans. Sit down with us and listen. Now what, five Hawaiians are leaving the legislature? They're running for all different offices? Look, look at how many left the House of Representatives. They're all Hawaiians. You got Jared, you got, um, get, I just talk a lot, so move, yeah, move on. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. King, please. I think one of the things that's important to remember about all board positions of any kind is prioritization. And I think people have had a lot of criticism of the audit, but I don't know if it's all, I, mean, I think they might, some of it might be valid, but at some level we have to recognize that not all of it is. I mean, the audit was saying that policies were not being followed, and I'm not sure anyone's saying that that's not true. Maybe he missed some things, maybe not, but there is a perception absolutely in the community right now that OHA is in complete disarray and dysfunction. Going to the legislature to ask for more money to be put into the organization will not be my top priority as a trustee. My top priority will be to 
bring back that responsibility and accountability and transparency, and then it'll push be to push for more accurate data that OHA will have. I mean, I've pointed out that the research division of OHA is using data from the U.S. Census that simply is not accurate enough to help them provide services to Native Hawaiians. The margin of error is so large on that, it's, it's inaccurate. It's just not get serving them. And we have the list. We've used them in Na'iapuni, millions of dollars for the elections. We can use them to have anonymous polling and gather more accurate data. And it's those kinds of things we need to be talking about and looking at right now. I, in the next four years, pushing for more money from the ceded lands is not going to benefit OHA. It is just going to push people away. Thank you, Mr. Kick. Uh, and lastly, uh, Ms. Kia Aina, please, you have one minute. Uh, clearly, I agree that um, the funds are insufficient, and I would employ a three-prong approach. Uh, first, uh, I agree that it's hard to advocate for funding or policies at um, the legislature if your house is not in order. So uh, first, um, the, you have to have the right people in the Board of Trustees to ensure that everything is in order and that you restore the trust to the public and our community. Uh, second, you need to be effective in advocacy at the legislature. I already have talked about a proven track record of being an effective advocate. Uh, that's within the trustees as well as the staff level. And then lastly, uh, identification of our allies, whether they're Hawaiian or not. And overall, if you take these steps and employ that strategy, you get to uh, be an effective advocate with your collective allies and hopefully achieve your objective. And I would continue to pursue it immediately upon election. Great, thank you very much. Uh, moving along to our next category of questions, uh, programs and services uh, to Native Hawaiians. Each candidate was given a list uh, four questions and they were asked to select two uh, concerning programs and services to our, our people. Juanita. Candidate King, candidate Leahuisa, and candidate Ayla chose to answer the first question, which is as a candidate for trustee of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, do you agree do you agree with the current approach of grants to organizations to deliver programs and services to Native Hawaiians? If yes, why do you believe the approach is effective? If not, what approach would you advocate for? You have 60 seconds to answer this question. May we begin with candidate King. Thank you for that question. I think I obviously would reiterate once again that having that data is vital to providing effective programs. I, whether or not we agree with the program, I mean, I think it's clear from the audit that the policies are there, they just need to be followed. And you can do that through the competitive grants process. I think that should shift to the focus. One of the problems that the second audit pointed out was that the grants, they're supposed to track who gets the grants and where they go, but they're not actually tracking the ownership of the people that receive the grants. And that's one of that, Perceived cronyism is one of the most it biggest issues that OHA faces, not just in the non-Hawaiian community, but in the Native Hawaiian community. You talk to any Native Hawaiians, they're like, where's OHA? Where's their money? It's going to their cousins. And you have to fight that perception, and you have to follow those policies and procedures. So that's what I would want to do. I'd want to see, I'd look at the policies and follow the policies. And I'd train to do that. I have board experience, I've explained to do that. You go through contracting policies and procedures as in-house counsel, I follow those policies and procedures. That's what I would do. I'd focus more on competitive grants and I'd focus on gathering that data. Because once you can prove that your programs are effective and they're having an impact, then you can restore that trust and you can start advocating for things like you need more money for this program or that program. Mahalo, Neil. Mahalo. Um, candidate? Trustee. I pulled a policy right out from our OHA book here. We got four, OHA administers four grant opportunities. Ahuhui, community, sponsorships, and the Kulia initiatives. And everything is spelled out. Well, what I don't really agree, is, this is done every two years. So I think the budget, oh, I think it's eight mil, the budget for two years. For the... Um, a uh, hui grant, that's 200000 Then you submit it, then you have the rules. It's kind of screwed up, so that's why we're revamping our whole, we have an ad hoc committee looking at the grants process. 
and in that department, the director got, yeah, he's gone. So we're redoing it. So I know you said talk about it right now, but we do have policies and we're going to have to revamp it to make it a little simpler and more fair. Thank you. Thank you so much. And candidate Ayla. Yeah, there's absolutely no question that the, the grant uh, process uh, needs to be revamped. Um, but we also have to take a look and separate like the um, auditor made the mistake there I'm sure there are other grants uh, other things that are considered grants that are that are really government to government mm -hmm. agency uh, agreement so we need to separate those out so that the truth is actually is actually out there and then what we need to do is um, take a look at um, the criteria in which the grants are being given and then the uh, competitiveness of course um, I think is important uh, but we also have to understand that um, some of these grants are actually going to build, going towards building um, institutional memory. They're going to build capacity. Uh, they're going to improve uh, the, um, the lives of, of uh, our children and grandchildren. And uh, you, it's not always easy to to measure success um, in just a number. And so I, I hear um, other candidates calling for you know, numbers, but there are intangible things to Hawaiians that are very, very important that you cannot put a number on, but you can measure. You can see it um, in the development of a child or in the, uh, re the lack of recidiv recidivism in, um, in inmates who come home. Candidate Ayla. Thank you. All right, moving along to the next question. Uh, regarding the issue of homelessness, Native Hawaiians are at the top of the list of those homeless in, in our state. If elected as a trustee, what kinds of programs and services uh, would you advocate for uh, to help Native Hawaiians who are homeless? Uh, also, in what ways can OHA uh, assure that Native Hawaiians have access to affordable housing? Uh, candidates uh, Ahu Isa, Kia Aina, and Lee chose to answer this question. So let's begin with uh, Trustee Ahuisa. You have 60 seconds. Yes. Well, I can share with you one program we're working on now because the rail is going to go right past OHA, and it's designated a TOD, Transit Orient um, Development Station. You get unlimited height. You can go up 14, 20 stories. So we're looking at using the parking lot in front of OHA, affordable rentals, affordable housing for Hawaiian people. Uh, we're we're working on that, um, trustee chair knows over here. So if given a chance to get in again, um, we, we are working on develop, yeah, I'm trying to leverage the money we have. Okay, we cannot only use OHA money, we got, cause we do, I'm looking at DHHL okay, to help us do that. Cause so many are on the waiting list. You know, there's no way we can fill all the, our, our people can, can get houses like that. So kupunas need homes. Look, one Kawakawa, uh, all of these plaza, all senior citizen homes is filled. What can we do that for the Hawaiian people? So what's, that's one thing we're looking at. I can share with you. And I'm also talking, some people have jobs, they're just homeless. At the Hilton where I work, I have, labor, I have boys that work for me and they sleep in their vans at Kakakumakai because they live one and they cannot get up early to get to work. So they sleep there, they go work at the hotel, they take a shower, they eat in the cafeteria, then they go work. But they tell me they cannot afford a studio in Waikiki, $2,000 for a studio. You know, they're Hawaiian. I want to help them. So to me, to run for OHA, to get into OHA, you got to be really passionate. You got to love what you do. It's not easy because you get criticized from everybody. People, you know, my cousins are Chinese, Portuguese, so on. I tell me, yeah, and what are we doing? How come they're all homeless? How come they're all in the jails, 90% incarcerated? And so that's what I want to do for the homeless people, at least rentals or some place to stay. So, mahalo. Thank you. There is no shortage of passion in our people. Yes. Uh, let's proceed. Uh, Ms. Kia Aina, your, your 60 seconds, sure, please. Thank you. While I uh, believe that the county, state, and federal agency should be the primary drivers uh, on both these issues, Earth, uh, OHA certainly uh, can play an important role. And so uh, I would utilize both uh, policy advocacy and funding, of course, to achieve those objectives. And 
have a layered approach in how you're dealing with the issue because um, in doing so, you'll be uh, more strategic in your targeting. So first off, of course, is that um, Department of Hawaiian Homeland beneficiaries are OHA beneficiaries. So uh, it is a role for OHA to help in making DHHL more effective and fighting with them for increased funding. Second, uh, target our larger Hawaiian community who uh, aren't on, on Hawaiian homelands and are in dire need of affordable housing. Uh, and third, uh, addressing affordable housing issues in general help Hawaiians because we're part of the overall public. So very important issue. I, should, I believe it should be a strategic priority for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lee, your one minute. Um, Mr. and Mr. Lee? Mr. Lee. <laughs> Mr. Lee, excuse me. A little so brevity. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, through the strategic plan that OHA currently has that expires this year, um, on average, OHA spent um, about $1.5 million a year on economic development and just under $3.5 million a year on housing. Um, as we've, the question states that um, ho homelessness is a big issue for Native Hawaiians. It's a big issue for the state in general. But if we're only investing in a, a fraction of the money for economic development, how can we expect our people to afford a house? We already know that they need affordable housing. So we need to develop better economic drivers so that they can afford to get houses. I agree that we need to do more partnering with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Um, I'll give you a very good example. Where the Bolorama is on King Street in Eisenberg, that's DHHL land. We can put maybe three houses on that or we can demolish it and build a 25-story high-rise. You can put businesses on the first ground floor that will drive economics into those systems so to help raise more money for DHHL. We can put affordable housing on the first five floors and the rest of it, beneficiary leases. Mahalo. Thank you. Next question. Very good ideas and mahalo rating. Mm -hmm. Excellent commentary. <laughs> so, Regarding education, Native Hawaiians have scored disproportionately lower than non-Hawaiians on standardized tests. As an elected OHA trustee, what is your opinion about the cause of this low performance on standardized educational tests, and what programs or services would you advocate to facilitate Native Hawaiians doing better on educational tests? Candidate. Thank you. Uh, as someone who has always scored uh, below average or average unstandardized uh, tests uh, throughout my life, uh, this question hits home. And so for starters, um, the cause, of course, is uh, the failure of uh, school systems, especially the public school systems, to properly uh, prepare our students to take uh, to take standardized tests. Second, of course, is social economic status. Uh, I was the uh, last of seven children, and for some reason, I, I never went to preschool or kindergarten, and I didn't even know that until I went to first grade and realized I was ill prepared uh, for first grade. And so um, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, "I got to catch up quick." Uh, Kamehameha schools, the public school systems, and the Native Hawaiian charter schools are all in a better position to help with overall raising of the scores, but OHA can play a role in uh, tutorials, providing assistance with all of these partners to provide assistance for, um, uh, to help in testing assistance. And that's something I utilize for both graduate and uh, law school. Uh, it costs a lot of money, and, but, it, but at the end of the day, it was able to help me improve my own livelihood. Uh, students shouldn't have to uh, be worried about it on their own. Um, our schools have failed us. Mahalo, Esther, mahalo. Um, Kleaina Lee. Um, mahalo. Um, so the question actually is worded a little weirdly in my mind. I was the exact opposite of Esther. I suffered because I excelled on standardized tests. I learned at a very young age that there's a system to taking these tests. And if you follow that system, you can be done with the test very quickly and be done and can go home. So I actually struggled in school because I tested much above my actual 
level. So I struggled in school. So if we want our kids to do better on standardized tests, then that's one thing. We, that can be taught. Someone can be taught to take a standardized test. But if we want to help our kids get a better education or do better in life, then education is the key, not standardized tests. That's the reason why charter schools, Kamehameha schools, they no longer use standardized tests. They use what's called learner outcomes, which is very, very different. That actually measures what the learner outcomes is, what base level and beyond did the student retain from the educational process. It's not a A, B, C, D, check the box, which is what a standardized test is. And um, candidate Esther Kia Aina, you had 60 seconds and you did really well. Also, ditto for Kale Aina Lee. So mahalo nui. Thank you. All right, we now move to the topic of governance. Uh, a key goal of the OHA strategic plan of, uh, between 2010 and 2018 is to facilitate a process that would give Native Hawaiians the opportunity to create a governing entity that would define Native Hawaiians as a political rather than racial group. The benefit of such a governing entity would be its ability to provide Native Hawaiians with greater control over their destiny as they move towards self-determination and self-sufficiency. If elected as an OHA trustee, how would you advance this goal? And would you provide funding to enable achievement of this goal? Uh, you have one minute to answer this question, each of you. We'll start with Mr. Lee. Um, if elected, would I apply funding to this goal? I would, in the form of education. And that's very different than the tact that OHA has taken in the past. And what I mean by that is there's a systemic misunderstanding about the difference between self-determination for Native Hawaiians and the restoration of the kingdom. One has nothing to do with the other. You did not have to be Native Hawaiian to be a subject to the crown of the kingdom of Hawaii. Self-determination self or self-governing entity for Native Hawaiians has nothing to do with the kingdom. And that's what most people out there don't understand. And that, what I have found, um, especially in my role as a chair at the AHA, was the largest dividing factor among our people that they think it's one or the other, and it's not. Do we want a governing entity to help support and speak for Native Hawaiians? Do we want the kingdom to be restored? They're not the same. They're not one and the same. We can have both. One, they don't, they don't cancel each other out. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. King. Your one minute. I don't think OHA should spend any more money pursuing that goal, especially in the short term. I don't know if it's true that there's the dichotomy of people divided along wanting federal recognition or wanting sovereignty. I think there's also a divide between people who don't want any race-based determination for their government at all and people that are interested in some sort of race-based entity. And I don't think that is going to advance OHA's cause or the Native Hawaiian people. I'm, I mean, I think one of the things that Kaylee Iakina has said, who has endorsed me, is I'm proud to be an American, I'm proud to be a Hawaiian, and I would say the same. And I think that we can work within the framework that the United States has and be very successful. I don't, one of the concerns I have with continuing to push federal recognition or sovereignty or spending any money on that is the distraction it creates at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And I think the symptom of that distraction is, I sound like a broken record, but again, the fact that OHA has been in existence for 30 years and they still don't have margin of error in their data. They've been fighting over federal recognition, spending millions of dollars, and we still don't know what the median income is of the Native Hawaiians. Thank you. Uh, moving, moving on, Ms. Kia Aina. You wouldn't hear. Sure. First, as you phrase the question and you talk about political versus racial group, you're clearly talking about nation within a nation model. So let's let's deal with that question. Uh, that issue has been um, uh, addressed with the Department of the Interior Rule. It provides for an administrative process for Native Hawaiians to be able to organize, form a government, and be recognized. So uh, there is no need for OHA to be spending any funds with regard to advocacy for that objective because it's been achieved. Uh, 
with regard to organizing the government, while OHA can help in the facilitation, I believe it should be an independent process and a more prudent approach to ensure that there are no legal challenges is to either have the federal government or private sources fund the evolution of that process, especially with regard to voting. Mahalo. Next, we'll proceed with Mr. Ayla. Your one minute. Yeah, so the, uh, I'm, I'm amazed that you know, some, some of the folks that are pushing um, uh, the idea that um, this, this blood quantum is an issue. Uh, the blood quantum is only an issue because Congress made it an issue in 1921 with the passage of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, where the blood quantum for Native Hawaiians was decided to be at 50 percent. Um, that was really part of a, a solution to um, the issue of, of political recognition in terms of uh, the wrongdoings that was done uh, during the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii. So we need to get away from this race-based, it's not race-based, it's a politically based relationship between the United States and, and Hawaiians, and it's based in history. Um, anybody that um, would be opposed to um, continuing programs for Native Hawaiians would just fall into the trap of, um, and, and not seeking some form of federal recognition would fall into the trap of uh, dying by a thousand cuts. Every day in Congress uh, there are there are Congress people who seek out Hawaiian programs and their whole mission in life is to remove any kind of funding or any kind of preference for Native Hawaiians. So I think the audience has to understand that. It's not a scare tactic. Every day we watch it happen. All you have to do is look at the history of funding. You have to look at the history of legislation. There is an active movement um, to, to do away with Native Hawaiians by part of the country. Okay, mahalo. Uh, and lastly, we have um, Trustee Ahuisa, your response. I just want to pick up where um, Mr. Ayla left off because he talked about the 50 percenters. And now look, years down the road, he and I were at this forum Monday yeah, with um, Representative Jean Ward, and we talked about how in the end, we're not going to have any Hawaiians left because the percentage is going to get smaller and smaller and no, no more 50 percenters. And then most of the people that are Hawaiians are all moving to Vegas, a lot live in Henderson. I was telling people that some of the trustees at OHA, maybe we should have an OHA office in Vegas. You know, we have one in Washington, D.C. We have one on every island. And if Vegas is a ninth island and we have Hawaiians living there, they don't get the benefits and they're beneficiaries as well. I wrote an article in Kavai Ola talking about Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sorry, I'm, adjunct, I'm a professor, so I, I kind of teach entrepreneurship and management. Right now, I don't want to talk about no federal recognition or anything like that when our people are suffering. The basic needs, that's the hierarchy, you know, Maslow's hierarchy. Basic needs first, food, water, shelter, security, and then you can self-actualize at the top. So let's take care of that first, people. Like, the economy is not too good. It's going to turn you know, with President Trump in there. This is a Democratic audience, so I'm going to speak like that. Yeah, with him in there, you never know. Every morning I get up, I'm thinking, what's going to happen now? What's the stock market like? Take care of that first, and then we can look at that. Well, I, I want to be in our textbooks, the history of what happened to the Hawaiian people, illegally occupying this place. I work in the hotel industry. They use us. They prostitute us to get the cultural and the, and the traditional things, sell them to the tourists, come over here. Do we get money from it? Do we benefit from it? I looked at getting entrepreneurship when the volcano hit Susie's charter school over there. Uh, I got all these things that I'm thinking that they're really using the Hawaiian people. You know, they're using us for their own benefit. They don't want to give us the money, criticize us. And then they want to make us federal recognition. Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot agree with that right now. Okay, Mahalo, my time is pow, she says. I know I should be looking at the book. Okay, thank you. Juanita. I just want to mahalo all of you. All the candidates that came to participate with us as the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus um, of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. I wish I could install all of you, <laughs> honestly. 
That's how we get governance done, by having these diverse opinions and values and working together with all of the great people like yourselves who have spent your time and energy to come out and help our people. So I cannot mahalo you enough. I have one question here that I think really, really kind of sums up a lot of what we've been doing here tonight. And it's about governance. Do you support a Hawaii Constitutional Convention? Why or why not? You have 60 seconds to answer this question. And of course, you can still continue on because you guys are going to go out there and still tell the rest of the people of Hawaii why we need to have OHA continue and why we need to answer all the things we need to do for the Hawaiian people. So let's start with you, Trustee Le'ahu Isa. No. <laughs> I don't want no Constitution Convention. And why not? Well, when I was in the ledge, you tried to put on a ballot, you know, every 10 years it's to have it on. We always get people to just don't vote for it. So I'm hoping this time they don't vote for it. It's just a question as a constitutional, it's an amendment. That's correct. Yeah. It would be. No, because they're going to try to take away more of our land. Yeah. They want land. You don't think the Koch brothers are involved in this? They want all our land on the big island. Develop. Sorry. That's my Democratic side talking. Mahalo. Mahalo nui. Um, followed by Esther. Um, sure. Well, um, first, I think the idea of having um, the ability to vote every 10 years is a good one. Fortunately for us in Hawaii, we have one of the best constitutions in the country, uh, especially on um, Native Hawaiian issues, on uh, the environment. And as a result, why would you fix something that is broken? A lot of the concerns that have been raised, as far as uh, I know, are things that should be done uh, statutorily at the legislature. So this idea that people are tired and therefore we should have a con-con and uh, um, amend the Constitution is backwards. You hold the legislators accountable. In any society, you always do a constitutional amendment last. Yeah. So. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the time is not right, and I'm proud of our uh, constitution that protects um, our rights for Native Hawaiians. And uh, a lot of the judicial system, uh, judicial uh, cases actually are interpreting all of those strong prov provisions, especially on Native Hawaiian uh, customer and traditional rights. We need to do a little better on kuleana rights, a little more complicated, but with Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian being an official language, the establishment of OHA? No, it's not the time for Kankan. Kan. Mahalo. Kale Aina. Uh, I think you're going to hear that <coughs> resounding um, across that no, it's not the time for a Kankan. Kan. Um, do I think a Kankan Kan is a good thing? I, I do, especially as a parliamentarian. Um, I've participated in at least three Kankans in my life in different various forms um, with the other. Native Hawaiian entities that I participate in. Um, but there's so much that can be taken away, you know, not just from Native Hawaiians, but from LBGT community, from um, land protection, from water protection, you know, all of the, the um, Clean Water Act, you know, all, all of that can be taken away. You know, I, this country hasn't had a constitutional convention since Hawaii had it. Um, the last serious look at a constitutional convention was by Alaska. And um, I read a report that was submitted to the governor of Alaska about the Hawaiian con con. Um, that's, how it's, that's how high a standard the, the con con of 78 is, is held. Um, there are those out there that would seek to turn Hawaii into a commodity. And the only way that they could do it would be through a con con. So if People, when people come forward and start pushing for it, because it will come, um, people out there need to seriously ask themselves and investigate who is actually pushing for that and what their real motives are. But as Native Hawaiians, we need to be prepared to run as delegates should it happen. Mahalo. Mr. King. I've mentioned before that I think it's important to have priorities and a con con for the state of Hawaii is not a priority of mine in any way, shape, or form, and I wouldn't walk around advocating for it. I don't know 
what the value is. Maybe somebody could convince me, but it's not something I'm going to spend my time thinking about. What I'm going to spend my time thinking about is how to build more homes for Native Hawaiians and for all the people in Hawaii. We need to start focusing and advocating for more development in the city, more density, more housing, and you need to look at creative solutions to the concept of affordable housing, to look at ways to build smaller units and larger units inside a single complex. You can mix income so that people of a lower income can buy a smaller unit and build up to a larger unit and have all of these solutions instead of just constantly looking at, we want more government regulation to guarantee someone a price for a commodity. In the end, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. A con con is not a priority of mine. And as we pointed out, there's a very serious threat to OHA. If it doesn't clean house, people will push for the abolishment of OHA at a con con. Thank you, Mr. King. Bill. Yeah. So a resounding no. Um, but I do think we have to prepare. So you always hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So uh, in addition to Native Hawaiians getting organized, getting educated on how a con con is run, um, there needs to be some strategic partnering with labor, with environmental uh, folks, because um, all of the things that uh, are being talked about uh, being changed at a con, con are traditional customary practices, the water code, um, collective bargaining. So all the things that uh, are important to many Native Hawaiians because they're, they're environmentalists at heart. Water is very important to all of the state agencies that do develop for Native Hawaiians. The, um, many of them are union members. And so the, the removal of collective bargaining is, is really, really important to uh, our people, as well as the, the removal of traditional customer practices. Our kupuna did not uh, take their effort in 1978 lightly. They organized, they partnered, and they prevailed. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. Mahalo. Great. Mahalo. All right, we're coming to a close. Uh, let's let's proceed uh, with closing remarks uh, by our candidates. Thank you so much for for all of your thoughtful answers. Uh, let's begin. Uh, I'd like to give uh, 30 seconds to each of you with, for your closing remarks. Let's begin with um, Mr. Isla, please. So Thank you. you. Like at 90 seconds. Actually. Okay. <laughs> well, what we need to do is we need to be. We need to be, well, I'm not clear now. How, are we doing? How much do I get? We are doing 30 seconds. 30 seconds, yes. okay. My 30 seconds Wait. starts now. <laughs> we need to be innovative. Uh, OHA needs to partner. Uh, a good example in uh, Kakakomakai mm -hmm. is the use of DHHL's um, ability to have its own zoning so that you don't have to deal with HCDA. We could work out a deal with uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and we could uh, create uh, a community there that is um, vibrant, that is full of Native Hawaiians, as well as commercial opportunities for both agencies, and we can move our beneficiaries forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ahuisa, your 30 seconds, please. Oh, what a question. Your closing, <laughs> your closing, closing remarks. remarks. Yes. I'm sorry. Well, just give me another four years. I'm the oldest of all of you. You know, like Esther's my daughter's classmate. <laughs> Brenda's <laughs> wife is my son's classmate. <laughs> oh, I go to uh, Kauai and, and Mr. Chuck tells me, oh, Rod, your son is my classmate. So I'm class of 61 with Mike Chan. That's how old I am. So just one more term, four years, and I, I try my best to help and then leave. That's all. Mahalo. Okay, mahalo. Mr. Lee, your, your, your last remarks. Um, we need to be more creative. We need to clean, um, bring civility back to the boardroom. And it really comes down to that. Mahalo. Mr. King, your final remarks, please. We do require civility in the boardroom, but we also must recognize the trust deficit o OHA is operating under with the community. And we need to bring about accountability and change. Mm -hmm. And that's what I stand for, and that's what I'm going to bring. And I want to bring, as I've stated, data and evidence-based policy back to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And I want to build more houses that Native Hawaiians can buy and get people into houses in Hawaii. Thank you. And, and lastly, uh, Ms. Kiaina. Sure. Uh, well, thank you so much to the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus for giving us this opportunity. Again, my name is Esther Kiaina, and I'm running for the Oahu seat for the Board of Trustees. Uh, this is a critical time uh, for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and I believe I bring the relevant work experience and a demonstrated uh, track record of contributions to our community 
and I humbly ask for your support for the Oahu seat for the Board of Trustees. Mahalo. All right, thank you very much uh, to, to our panelists here. Uh, can we give them a round of applause? Thank you very much. Again, I want to thank all, all candidates for participating tonight. Uh, there was a lot shared. Um, I also want to thank our viewing audience. Uh, thanks for tuning in uh, these last uh, couple of hours. We also want to remind you that the primary election is, is coming quick. It's, half, it's on August 11th. Please uh, register to vote. Uh, there is still time to, to register to vote and to go and vote. Um, and lastly, if you want to learn more about the office, uh, excuse me, about the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus, uh, please visit our website, hawaiianaffairs.org, or visit us on social media uh, on Facebook at Hawaiian Democrats. I want to thank uh, my colleague here, uh, Juanita, for, for co-hosting this panel with me. Thank and you very mahalo much. Mahalo to you too also. Thank you. you. kept thank us you. going. So thank you. Mahalo Again, mahalo you. and aloha. Aloha. Aloha mai kako. Well, that's a wrap. We have brought to a close our first OHA candidate forum hosted by the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. And for this closing segment, I have Ente Momi Khan by my side. She is the president of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus. She is the one who took the initiative to organize this great event so that everybody could be engaged, informed, and build some momentum into the primary election, and then we're going to keep on trucking through the general election. What, what do you yes. have to say, Auntie? Yes. Great job, by the way. Yes. Mahalo yes. Yes. Thank you. You know, the forum tonight um, was held for the purpose of providing, we hope, good information um, to help all of us to elect the very best candidates to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. It's so, so important that we get, get good people in because we have many, many needs, but few resources, limited resources. And so our trustees help to make the decision of what is most important to fund um, for the betterment of our people. So do vote because that's what's important. Mahalo. Yes. And again, mahalo nui to everyone that helped coordinate this event. Absolutely. And I just want to yes. say something yeah. real quick. Uh, you know, to my uh, esteemed peers who joined me here tonight, um, uh, Rebecca Soon, Jacob Aki, mm -hmm. we really tried to make this a little bit light, share some information, educate, and, and really make it easy to digest and have some fun. But, you know, ultimately, this is very serious stuff. You know, OHA was created on the, on the, on the hard work, on the shoulders of our kupuna. Uh, mm -hmm. People literally lost their lives fighting for justice for Native Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, activism is at the core of everything that we do. And it's really important that we uh, acknowledge the work of our kupuna. People went to jail. They lost their lives. They fought really hard. And for every, all the current trustees now in the past, the 40 years that OHA now coming on 40 years, they've been around. Mahalo nui to all of them. And, and mahalo nui to all the candidates that are running, mm -hmm. you know, as... We keep going uh, and we progress into the future. I believe our next generation is really going to, they're ready to take the reins and work hard and follow the footsteps and the guidance that all of our makua and kupuna have provided. So mahalo nui. And uh, mahalo nui, mahalo nui to Davis and to all of the Hawaiian Affairs Caucus members. You saw them um, as commentators, as moderators, as behind the scenes, hospitality. I mean, just um, a lot of good good uh, spirit and togetherness in putting on the forum tonight. Mahalo. Yeah, so, and you. lastly, again, just want to reiterate, primary elections coming up on August 11th. Yeah. That's a Saturday. And then actually, you know, a lot of people don't know that uh, in each of the counties and probably on each of the islands, there should be early walk-in voting for the two weeks prior to the primary election. And this year is unique in that you can actually walk in and register on the same day. Okay. That's huge, you know, people fought for that for a long time and in other states and, and, and on the continent, it's had a huge impact on how the elections end up going. So, mahalo nui, make sure you get out and vote. For more information, visit hawaiianaffairs.org. We have some next generation leaders over here. Our good friends want to come in and, and shout out. They wanted to photo hey! about everybody. Aloha. See you the general. Thank you.